Senate session. So I'm waiting for a few more of our Senate committee to join us. I understand it was originally scheduled for one o'clock. We will start in the next minute or two. So uh, please, uh, patience. Thank you. Okay, welcome to the Education Health and Environmental Affairs Committee. Uh, today, March 9th, um, we have a number of bills, I believe uh, 14 or 15, 15 to be exact. Uh, we will hear them and I'll give you an order in just a moment. We um, will have the uh, sponsor present the bill, then we will have his or her witnesses Starting with the proponents, uh, lead proponent has up to five minutes, although they are not required to use all their time. Uh, and subsequent witnesses have two and a half minutes. I will let you know if, position. Uh, if that is the case, uh, you might want to tailor your comments and be even more succinct than you plan on being. Um, uh, that being said, we're going to start with Senator Young <clears throat> to be followed by Senator McRae. 
Senator Ellis, Senator King, and Senator Lee, uh, 554, 915, 662, 711, 733. Uh, uh, one of our members is presenting, at least one of our members is presenting a fairly extensive bill in another committee. And we are uh, expected to send one of our committee members there because education, health and environment is a secondly, second uh, directed committee on that bill. So uh, Senator, Senator Riley may leave us at some point for that bill. Um, and to, just to reiterate, other members may be in other committees at different times, just because they're not in their seat does not mean they're not working elsewhere in the complex. With, um, let's start with Senator Young. Um, 554 Higher Education Return Peace Corps Volunteers in-state tuition. Um, Senator Young. Uh, thank you, Chairman Pinsky, members of the committee. Uh, Senate Bill 554, 554 will allow Maryland to serving in the Peace Corps to retain or automatically restore their in-state status upon returning to Maryland from deployment overseas in the Peace Corps. Uh, this will allow them to be eligible for in-state tuition and eligible for state uh, delegate and senatorial scholarship, just as Marylanders uh, returning from the military deployment after their separation. Uh, Peace Corps volunteers are change makers who promote world uh, peace, uh, international friendship and cross-cultural collaboration. And they build local capacity for addressing problems to improve lives and advance greater understanding of the United States and our people while increasing our collective understanding of other nations and people around the world. Uh, in in uh, 2019, Maryland ranked fifth among the states in the number of Peace Corps volunteers per capita with 259 serving in uh, 2019. Of the over 240,000 volunteers that have served in Peace Corps since 1961, six and a half thousand have been Maryland residents. Um, in 2020, 66 University of Maryland College Park alumni joined the Peace Corps, uh, raising the University of Maryland to ranking fourth in the nation in uh, students attending or joining the Peace Corps. Um, this was brought to our attention when a young woman uh, was called home from the Peace Corps during the pandemic. And uh, she had never changed her Maryland address, still listed as her home address. But when she uh, re-entered the University of Maryland, she had to apply for a residency petition and she was denied that because Peace Corps is not uh, an allowed exception. So, uh, her unexpected loss of residency status increased her tuition and made her ineligible for delegation or senator uh, scholarships. So um, for many, this time in the Peace Corps work is transitional shaping the direction of their professional and personal uh, lives for years to come. And it shouldn't be a discouragement to join the Peace Corps and uh, lose your residency. So I would hope that we could uh, pass this and let them have the same benefits that teachers uh, returning, that military personnel and their spouses, when they return, uh, still have that residency. Uh, there is one amendment to it that the community colleges uh, brought in that I hope everyone has, which just guarantees that they'll be included as in-state residents for computation of state aid to community colleges in, in accordance with the 16-305 of, of this uh, article. Um, this has already passed the uh, House 137 to one. And I would hope that uh, this committee would move favorable on it. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Young. Um, questions from the committee? Uh, Senator, uh, I have one. Is, is this, is the intent to um, take someone who was previously a resident of Maryland and then return to Maryland, or do they not have to have lived in Maryland previously but settled in Maryland? It's the bill is ambiguous on that, and well, it's clear to I, me. 
I think the intent uh, was what you stated, but frankly, upon reading it, I think someone from outside of Maryland that moved back to Maryland and established residency would also be eligible. Um, so then you, you wouldn't object to an amendment to fulfill your intent? Uh, I wouldn't. I don't, I'm not sure how it passed the House, but no, I, I wouldn't be object to that. Okay, uh, if community council will note that, that'd be great. Um, I believe I have Senator Riley. Thank you, <clears throat> uh, Senator Young. Effective date of the bill? Uh, I would assume, I don't, uh, we didn't put it in as emergency legislation, so I would assume it would be uh, October as is per usual for a bill. Mr. Chair, would I like to recommend the committee consider an emergency bill so it's effective in September. Thank you. I appreciate that. I would agree with it. Uh, seeing no further question, that concludes the hearing on um, Senator Young's bill. Thank you, Senator, for joining us. Thank you. Is that the only one Senator you have with us today? Uh, uh, I believe it is. It is. Okay. Um, next, we're going to go to 915. I believe, uh, Senator McRae, and that bill is Blueprint for Maryland's Future Performance Standards Clarifications. Uh, welcome, Senator. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is probably one of my favorite com committees. I don't think I spend any more time than my other committee than this one. But uh, hi, Madam Vice Chair, uh, members of the committee. For the record, Corey McRae, Senator from the 45th Legislative District. I come to you today on behalf of Senate Bill 915. It's simply a clarifying uh, bill of what's already in Comar. Um, basically, in, in a nutshell, uh, I had a community of folks from the arts community that felt as though um, when we were doing the blueprint, they just wanted to clarify that uh, our, our arts programming uh, was operated in a manner that it was suggested in within Comar. Um, this will not just help with our schools, but it also help with the development of our young people, their social development, emotional development, and mental development, and making sure that we lift up that art is important for our schools. I'm joined by a panel of folks um, that will speak to the importance of this, but I just hope that the committee will vote favorable in reference to Senate Bill 915. Thank you, Mr. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you, uh, Senator McRae. Uh, we're going to start with uh, Rick Tyler, followed by uh, Quinice Floyd and Jeannie Painter. I do, I do not see any opposition. I do not see any opposition signed up uh, either oral or written. Uh, please, uh, Mr. Tyler, welcome to the committee. Uh, thank you, Senator Pensky, members of the um, committee. Uh, my name is Rick Tyler. I'm the chair of the Maryland Education Coalition. And I'm joined today by two other members, uh, Shanetta Martin and uh, Cornice Floyd, and also Jean Painter, uh, who are also members of our group. We also encourage you to read uh, written testimony from a student uh, from Poly uh, Baltimore Polytechnical Institute by the name of Jennifer Zay. Uh, Mac is in front of you today to urge the support of Senate Bill 915, and we urge the committee to support this bill. So it can become part of the implementation of the blueprint and students will have access to a quality, well-rounded education with the goals of graduating college and career ready from day one. MEC believes the term performance standards in the blueprint legislation is vague and subject to interpretations. These regulations collectively are, are not um, are not based on theories or, exper or experiments and are listed on page three and four of our written testimony. Each are thoroughly researched evidence-based standards, practices, and programs vetted and accepted inside and outside of Maryland by a wide range of experienced public education administrators, educators, other experts, and stakeholders, including MEC, with technical assistance from career MSDE and sometimes DLS staff. They're regularly reviewed to ensure they are current and compatible with other state and federal laws and policies, including the ESA, IDA, and ADA. What is Title 13A in Comar? They cover a wide range of public education operations, programs, and services, and are broad enough 
but also flexible so local school districts can adequately implement them within their diverse communities. They address major student subgroups, major subjects, and program areas, as well as administrative and personnel issues. And an equity lens is used when applicable. In recent years, the state has addressed several of interest to the General Assembly members, such as education equity, graduation requirements, pre-K programs, financial literacy, and discipline. Today, we will highlight gifted and talented education in the fine arts. Comar regulations take an extended time to develop and finalize with a multi-layer approval process, including the developing committee, then state and local education administrators before going to the state board for consideration and approval. Others who may play an oversight role include the General Assembly, AL, ALR committee. Some also reported and reviewed and uh, approved by the US Department of Education and they could come before the recently created Accountability and Implementation Board if applicable to their charge. MECA has been in existence for over 40 years, made up of 20 statewide organizations. Our members and staff can be found within all Maryland public education communities from west to east, north, south, and often in between. The organization includes members with extensive experience inside and outside of uh, public education including um, the proposed development and implementation of Comar regulations, other state and federal laws. The representatives include former state and local senior administrators, educators, a variety of subjects, wraparound service professionals, as well as lawyers, civil rights, youth, parent, and community advocates. And some receive state and national recognition. Therefore, um, MEC um, strongly suburb, um, urges the committee to support SB 915, a simple technical amendment to the blueprint for Maryland's future by clarifying the use of the term performance standards by referring to Comar Title 13A. This will ensure all 900,000 students have access to a quality, well-rounded led education led by highly qualified educators, administrators, and support staff. I thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, let us go to um, uh, Ms. Floyd. Good, after good afternoon. There's, there's no opposition to the bill. Good afternoon, Chairman Pinsky and the members of the Education, Health and Environmental Committee. Um, as Rick stated, my name is Kwanis Floyd. I am the Executive Director of Arts Education in Maryland Schools, also known as AIMS. Um, AIMS, as a member of the Maryland Education Coalition, is in front of you today to urge your support of Senate Bill 915, the Blueprint for Maryland's Future Performance Standards Clarifications. I want to take the time to thank Senator McRae for his leadership and for introducing this bill. We urge the committee to support the bill so it can become part of the implementation of the blueprint and students will have access to a quality, well-rounded education with the goal of graduating or career ready um, from day one. This uh, technical amendment will clarify the use of performance standards by linking adequate funding to providing those resources necessary for schools to meet the standards and requirements laid out in Maryland Comar Regulation 13A. Um, this is a necessary amendment since Comar provides a concise list of all of the components of a well-rounded holistic education for Maryland students, including the arts. Without this as clarification, the existing biases towards standardized testing subjects will continue to prevail and students across Maryland will continue to be deprived of their civil rights to arts education and other subjects under Comar and of a necessary component of human development and 21st century preparedness. So I wanna uh, give you a bit of an excerpt from Frank Geary and Melissa Shriver in an article that's entitled, Our Kids Need Arts Education Now More Than Ever. Here is what is lost without it. There's no time to waste, no different than grown-ups. Kids today are walled in, lacking human interaction and adrift in anxieties that nobody should have to worry about. Researchers are tracking a global surge in the number of young people reporting symptoms of clinical depression and to make things worse, school-based mental health services are hamstrung. The good news is that we can help young people not only express and channel difficult emotions, but also to find their spirit's song. Painting and ceramics, music and dance, theater and chorus, photography and film, these aren't merely hobbies. These are some ways that humankind's most liberating pathways to creativity and catharsis. 
Anyone who stood before an ancient sculpture and felt wonder or listened to a piece of music and felt peace or gazed at a painting and experienced the sublime grasp of the power of art to transmit emotion across the ages. And arts, just like architecture and design, teach us to imagine and create a future that all of us can share. Nothing moves us like the arts. And so the arts are a critical piece of the uh, educational experience and allow our students to understand the world around them, to be together in times of isolation, to give them a voice, to discover who they are, to change thank and you. develop. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Floyd. Oh, yes, you are. Thank you. Okay. Um, Ms. Painter? You need to unmute, Ms. Painter. Good afternoon. Um, uh, Senator Pinsky and committee, uh, thank you for this opportunity. My name is Jean Painter and I'm representing McGate, the Maryland Coalition for Gifted and Talented Education. And we've been the voice for gifted children in Maryland for 40 years. And Senator Pinsky, I remember many times you attended our McGate receptions when we had them in Annapolis, so thank you. So Comor is important. Uh, because Comor 13A0407 for gifted and talented education, for example, uh, contains a world-class research-based um, standards for equity and excellence. Uh, for example, the Maryland uh, Comor defines gifted and talented students in a very inclusive way across all areas of endeavor and in all populations, including early learners, English language learners, special education students, and those living in concentrated poverty. In fact, Comor 13A requires every school to identify and serve gifted and talented students, even those schools in concentrated poverty. And school systems must identify 10% minimum of their population. That's 90,000 students minimum across our state. Comor 13A also specifies the, the um, professional competencies, the professional companies educators need to effectively meet both the academic and the social and emotional needs of these students. McGate is disappointed that gifted and talented students are not named in the blueprint. School systems must understand that the funding formula is there to meet the needs of these students as defined in, in Comor 13A. So we strongly submit, we strongly uh, submit our support for SB 915. We think it is a one step toward remediating this um, omission of gifted and talented students as a student group. They're not mentioned anywhere in the blueprint. Um, but we do hope that um, uh, that will be rectified in the future because what is not named does not exist and we cannot have that for our gifted and talented students in Maryland. So thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Ms. Painter. Um, questions for any of the panelists? Seeing no hands, uh, that concludes the hearing on Senate Bill 915. Thank you, Senator McRae, for joining us. Thank you, witnesses. Uh, we're gonna go to Senate Bill 662. Senator Ellis uh, is here. Um, uh, then uh, we will, he will be followed by Ms. Uh, Achel McKenzie, uh, Matthew Darden, Charlamar Douglas, and then we'll, we're all here from two with amendments, uh, Desiree Tucker and Frank Padanella. Those giving an amendments, please focus on the amendments rather than the bill. Other people will, will have already spoken to the bill. And I would also say if you're comfortable with material, Talk to us rather than, than reading testimony unless you need reading the testimony uh, to feel more comfortable. Okay, uh, Senator Ellis. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Vice Chair, Hagan, members of the Education, Health, Environmental Affairs Committee, Senator Arthur Ellis, District 28, to uh, um, present Senate Bill 662 on multicultural education. This is an issue that comes up a lot as I move around my district, <laughs> can you believe? Well, yes, I bet you can. Young people, a lot of high school students talk to me about the lack of adequate multicultural education. And so that is what persuaded me to put this bill in. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would ask uh, for, if you could allow 
my chief of staff to present this bill on my behalf. Okay. Uh, uh, yes. uh, just to have him tell us his name again or her name. Her name is Autumn Hi, Grant. Autumn Grant. Okay. Yes. Ms. Grant, uh, sure. So, hello, everyone. So, if I could get the slides up for Senate Bill 662. One second. Autumn, did you include those with, with your witness testimony? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Bear with me, they are coming. Perfect, thank you. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So this is Senate Bill 662, Education, a Commission on Multicultural Education Establishment. Next slide, please. So the purpose of Senate Bill 662 is really to ensure that multicultural education and cultural competency becomes a cornerstone of the Maryland public school experience. And this will be done through establishing a Commission on Multicultural Education that will conduct research and develop recommendations regarding a statewide curricula for multicultural education. Next slide, please. So what exactly will the commission do? So the commission will have two um, main objectives. First, it'll be developing standards for the statewide um, model of curriculum. And next will be developing specific coursework that relates to uh, African-Americans, Asian-Americans, Latin Americans, and native and indigenous peoples, groups that are traditionally underrepresented. Um, and one thing that is very special about this uh, commission is that it will have input from all three levels of uh, education, uh, public education in Maryland. There'll be elementary school level input, uh, middle school level input, and then high school level input from education professionals. And this is especially important because um, for those primary students in pre-K through fifth grade, they'll be experiencing an interdisciplinary multicultural lesson plan. Um, whereas students who are in uh, sixth grade through 12th grade all the way in their senior year will be doing more academic coursework um, and courses related to ethnic studies. So they have a more in-depth knowledge of these cross-cultural ideas. Next slide, please. So what is multicultural education? Multicultural education incorporates the perspectives, beliefs, teachings, and values of various cultures, social groups, and races and ethnicities. Um, and it does this by celebrating diversity. Ultimately, multicultural education teaches students to consider the needs and experiences of all types of people. Um, so what we're really looking at is making Maryland public school students citizens of the world, right? We want them to be globally competent, understand their place um, within society and not necessarily just have a um, Western or, or uh, American centric point of view when they address problems and go forward in moving about the world. Next slide, please. So why is this important? It helps students to develop a positive self-concept by providing knowledge about the histories and cultures of different con contributors to our American society. And it also allows for uh, a safe space to be made to discuss cultures, practices, and experiences different than their own. Um, there's a lot of opportunity to really break down barriers and have these more difficult conversations. And I think that'll be important to incorporate amongst students. Uh, it also recognizes the role that schools play in really developing the attitudes of a democratic society. Um, we've seen how leadership can override and take a negative course when there are not people in a power who have cross-cultural competency and an understanding of multicultural uh, education. Um, one thing that is especially important um, about this is on the level of teachers and impacting teachers. So as most of you may know, teachers um, do not usually reflect the demographics they serve. So teachers through this program as well will be getting um, cultural understanding of their students and have more of an opportunity to engage with the populations that they serve. Um, the commission is not only going to be um, creating curriculum for students, they'll be creating curriculum 
um, that is professional development for teachers and those education professionals so that there's an intergenerational impact of this legislation. They're going to have education professionals, administrators, and teachers, anyone that is a part of that academic structure within the buildings is going to be getting the same impact and hopefully um, it will create a ripple effect. So there's the intergenerational impact of education professionals as well as students. Next slide, please. So why implement multicultural education into the curriculum? So it has long-term benefits that help students to learn to appreciate the value and cultural social diversity of their peers. And it helps them to become citizens who recognize and promote equality and justice. Additionally, it allows individuals to examine their own social and cultural biases, break down these biases, and then change the perspectives of those around them. Um, I served as a resident assistant for two years during my time at university, and one of the big things that's a part of higher education is really breaking down those barriers um, that students get um, from their home uh, localities and really helping them to understand what it means to be a part of something larger than themselves. So I think we'll be setting up our Maryland uh, public school students for um, excellent achievement within their higher education concerns. Um, if they do, if they are exposed and have continually been exposed to cross-cultural methods and ways of thinking. Um, I've spoken about this legislation with a few educators and they did have positive reviews on it. So I would encourage everyone to support Senate Bill 662 to establish a commission on multicultural education. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Grant. Uh, let's go to uh, Ms. Ichelle McKenzie. Hello, and thank you for having me. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, Madam Vice Chair, and the committee members. I'm Angusa Ichile McKenzie with Southern Marylanders for Racial Equality. I'm thankful that Senator Ellis introduced this bill and I'm very happy to be here supporting this bill as a comprehensive path to ensuring equity and accuracy for all Maryland students. It brings our teachers training in culturally sound pedagogy and increases the number of teachers of color, bringing the teacher demographics more in line with the student demographic, as you just heard. It's been a while since I've been a full-time teacher. My last assignment as a home and hospital instructor, I taught a middle school student who had a worksheet in social studies. It was a companion worksheet to a chapter on immigration in the US. They listed enslaved Africans alongside the Irish, German, Italian, and Russian newcomers as immigrants who came to this country to grow cotton and other crops. There was even a set of immigration graphs showing the numbers of each group. So, not only did it sound to the students like these African people had a choice coming here, but also went on to explain that the problem with slavery was that the work was unpaid, <laughs> like it was an internship. Our curriculum teaches kids about battle, kidnapping, famine, assassination all the time. But when the lesson is about white on non-white violence, somehow the brutality is diminished or omitted altogether. This skewed history that our kids have been taught erases the struggles of people of color in relation to white supremacy. It fails to highlight the great Maryland of Marylanders of color who literally built this state and built this nation. Benjamin Banneker, Matthew Henson, and a myriad of others. It's time our children know the facts because those who don't know the history are what? Doomed to repeat it. Hence, we get a continuous cycle of racism, microaggressions, et cetera, from teachers, admins, and other students. We get unfair grading practices, tone deaf assignments, and uneducated and undereducated minority students suffering under the burden of low expectations. This bill gives an opportunity to make right what's not working for all students as we train them to be global and digital citizens of the 21st century. And you now in the Senate have the historic opportunity to put our kids and put our schools on the right path going forward. I also wanna give credit to Dr. Yele Ichile, who is my sister, who also helped craft this bill. And she is uh, the director of African American Studies Institute at Prince George's Community College. She's also here on the Zoom. So I didn't hear you call her chairman, but uh, I, I did. She did sign up to testify. I'm going to call on her right now. Thank you so much. Back to back. Miss Ayala Chile. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, as as uh, as my sister said, um, I'm I'm very glad to be here. I'm Dr. Iyeli Ichile. Um, in addition to being the director of the African American Studies Institute at Prince George's Community College, I also am a professor of history there. I teach Africana Studies, 
which includes African history, African American history, Latin American history, and Caribbean history. Prior to all of this, I have also taught in Montgomery County, Frederick County, Baltimore County, and I've done teacher trainings across the state around issues of multiculturalism. So this means I've seen a good bit of this state um, and been exposed to a wide range of different student and teacher populations. What I've observed semester after semester, program after program is twofold. One, students are in general woefully uninformed about their own histories and cultures, much less those of the other students with whom they share classrooms, with whom they share Maryland. My second observation is that students are often confused and frustrated about why they hadn't learned much or any of these very important cultural content areas until adulthood, until college. And another thing they think about is how learning all of this earlier might have impacted their trajectories right? The trajectories of their lives, their confidence, their values, their motivation level. They tend to be very thoughtful about how what they're learning in multicultural college classrooms like mine will help them become more sophisticated, more empowered, more informed residents of Maryland. That said, I believe this learning process should begin well before students get to my classroom. These students, particularly in community college, um, and again, I've taught at multiple community colleges, are already workers. Many of them are already parents, supervisors, voters, constituents. These really are the shapers of Maryland's present and its future. So establishing a commission on multicultural education in Maryland, particularly to, particularly to provide and guide a curriculum at K through 12 level is a critical measure which can cultivate greater cross-cultural understanding um, in our population, which might in turn generate a more equitable, just future for our state. This is why I support Senate Bill 662. I'm really thankful for your time and your attention. Uh, and I'll stop there. Uh, thank you, um, Ms. Achilli. Um, let's go to um, Matthew Darden, followed by uh, Shalimar Douglas. Um, good morning. Uh, my name is Matthew Darden, and I'm here. I, I submit this testimony um, in, in favor of uh, Senate Bill 662. Um, it is my belief that uh, teachers are here to guide our students and push them to think another way. Um, oftentimes, um, the teachers are, are making the students or pushing the students to, to think critically in ways that they may not be um, being taught at home. Um, in most instances, the curriculum and the school climate omits and devalues the contributions of black and brown students. Um, not to devalue black history um, by any means, but this should not be necessary. Um, black history is, is American history and should be taught as such. Um, to dig deeper, um, we talk about Columbus Day. Uh, Columbus Day is an example um, of a excuse me, <clears throat> Columbus Day is an example of a holiday that is in celebration of a white man that discovered America. Um, which devalues the people, the indigenous people that were here that owned this land prior to him discovering what we now call the United States. Um, so to whitewash um, Americans history and to remove the, the value and the input that indigenous people and people of cover, color have given and, con and contributed to history, um, it, it gives you a sense and is the underpinning of um, what white supremacists do that they are superior, they are better than because they are all that we see in the history books. So to not teach and, and give a full depiction of what the history of this country is, um, you, it's kind of one-sided. So our students need to see things that look like them, which is the history. It needs to be talked about. It needs to be expressed so that they see in the textbooks that they're learning from every day that they are and, and that they can do these things because it has already been done prior to them. Um, Again, I'm in support in favor of the, the standing up of this commission to look at um, the curriculum that is being currently being taught to our students. Um, because again, I think a third, party, a third party view of what is being taught and it is needed. You, you can always improve upon what is currently there because you never know um, what is being taught because you submit, you submit the, the, the curriculum and the, the, um, the textbooks and all that things, but we can always improve um, and, and that's, that, that is all I have to say at this moment. Great. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Darden. Let's go to uh, Ms. Douglas. Good afternoon. I am Shaw Lamar. I am speaking on behalf of the Maryland Alliance for Racial Equity. 
Um, MARI is a coalition of education, advocacy, civil rights, and community-based organizations that are committed to eliminating racial disparities in Maryland's education system. To that end, MARI supports with amendments, um, Senate Bill 662, um, 662 would establish a commission to study the recommendations. Um, what we want to make clear here is that we think it's important at this time in our history, our country is facing a lot of um, issues around race and racism. And this is definitely a time of reckoning for us as a nation. So it's even more important for us to be proactive about centering the history, contributions, and current day experiences of all Americans in our public school curriculum. Um, our children want to learn about themselves. They want to see themselves. I speak as an educator who taught middle and high school. Um, I speak as as a child who, as an adult who went to an elementary skip school here in Baltimore. Um, and I learned a lot about my history in my elementary school um, from my teachers, from the programs that we had all the time. Um, so many of those things have been taken out of our public schools um, and they do make a difference of, of how we develop ourselves and how we see ourselves and how our teachers see us um, too. So I know that this is not happening in our schools now. As a history teacher, I know that I had to bring these things to my teaching because it was not in the curriculum, nor was it in the text that, um, that were given to me to teach from. Um, so I want to encourage that this to understand that this bill we know is not a mandate for curriculum, but it would establish a process which would model coursework um, that can be developed to include historical and current events of impacting various ethnic groups, um, to include African Americans, Asian Americans, Latin Americans, Indigenous people. The process will allow legislators, school officials, and the state at the state and local levels of education um, to become content experts and to engage in the discussion. Um, another thing I want to add is that I know that in the Comar 13A and I, the, the, the different numbers. Ms. Douglas, uh, you're talking about, but I'm we done. have uh, 13 other, other bills today and a lot of, we got about 60 more speakers. So. Got you. I, I'm just going to say Mari's in favor of a vote for Senate Bill 662. Thank you. Uh, we're going to go to the two favorable with amendments. Uh, Ms. Tucker, Mr. Pan, uh, Panella. Uh, please speak primarily to the amendments. I think we're familiar with what the bill does. Uh, Ms. Tucker. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. My name is Desiree Tucker. Good afternoon, Chairman Penske members. Um, so I am in favor with amendments and essentially the amendment that I'll focus on is um, to make sure that commissioners are, are recommended um, and are pulled from the various minority caucuses and community groups and organizations because, and members of the community like me, I'll speak as my, from a, you know, from my own standpoint as a, as a parent, I'm in Frederick County and I have a three-year-old now and a seven-year-old. My, I'll tell a quick story. My first grader went, um, when he started here in kindergarten, the Black History Month came up. I asked his teacher, so what are you planning to do? And she said, well, we'll be celebrating all Americans. And she said, if you know, if you wanna talk about black history and what's gonna be going on there, then feel free to speak to the principal. There were no plans, superintendent. Well, it's up to every school to decide what it is that they wanna do. And that sent me down this rabbit hole from which I have not been able to escape. So someone has to be watching over this curriculum process at a state level all across the board and the members of, of this commission need to be folks who, who understand, who are in it like I am um, and who can speak to what should be there and what is missing because of conversations that I, they have with folks like myself. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let's go to Mr. Patanella. Hi, uh, thank you, uh, 
Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Frank Pentnell. I'm a senior education advocate um, for the ACLU of Maryland, and I will cut my testimony in half. Um, we need a curriculum that represents and that is inclusive of our diverse student population. Um, the curriculum must serve to center, affirm, and uplift the lives, the history, and the culture of our students, especially for black and brown students. And on a personal note, um, my parents are immigrants from different countries, and I have, I have to say that my childhood was traumatizing in a lot of ways, especially in school, because of my ethnic background and the way I look. Um, I felt lesser. It took me a long time to work through my own identity issues, and really it was my connection to my mom's side of the family and taking enrichment courses outside of school that helped me value and gain a strong sense of identity. Um, actually, one of these education institutions I attended is located in Wheaton, Maryland, in Montgomery County. Uh, the ACLU is asking for a couple of amendments to this bill. The first has to do with um, how commissioners are appointed, much like our, our last um, testifier. Uh, we ask that the recommendations of commissioners come solely and directly from the Black Caucus, Latino Caucus, Asian Pacific Islanders Caucus, and the Women's Caucus uh, to be approved by the governor, speaker, and Senate president. We believe this change is necessary to ensure that the process for identifying pers prospective commissioners is inclusive and that legislators can tap into their broad network um, of academic and community experts throughout the state so that we get the best commission possible. Secondly, for the development of um, teacher training programs and professional development programs, we'd like to see all of Maryland's HBCUs and broad language to include experts from other distinguished higher education institutions. Uh, to close, I urge your support for this bill with amendments. Not Let's not make a $4 billion investment in the blueprint bill without overhauling the curriculum. Let's not miss this big piece of the puzzle that represents another big game-changing opportunity to ensure that we are maximizing the potential and lifting up the history and culture of every student in Maryland. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Patanella. You would have been way overboard if you didn't cut it in half, that's for sure. Okay, uh, thank you all. That completes the hearing on that piece of legislation. Thank you, Senator Ellis and Ms. Grant. Uh, we're now going to um, uh, Senator King, and that is uh, 711. Uh, so if you're throwing dice, it should be a winner. Um, a Family Child Care Opportunities Pilot Program. Senator King will be followed by uh, Laura Wheeldryer, um, Barbara Andrews, Shiny John and Ruby Daniels. And I see no opposition and uh, we have 12 more bills. So please be succinct, ladies and gentlemen. And if you can avoid reading a testimony, please just speak to us. Thank you. Senator King. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. As this committee knows, I've been um, uh, quite an advocate many times in front of you for uh, child care programs. and. Throughout the, the United States, child care programs have been on the, um, the decline, I mean, through the whole United States. It's not easy for small businesses that are mostly women-owned to continue to stay viable without the support they need to get through permitting, licensing, regulatory requirements, along with the costs associated with this process. Montgomery County came up with a program to help people who want to start a family child care business by offering the support needed to get a program successfully up and running. Senate Bill 711 seeks to recreate that program in the state by setting up the Growing Family Child Care Opportunities Pilot Program. Pilot program will award grant money to one urban, one suburban, and one rural jurisdiction or child care licensing region with local match funding. Each area chosen to receive a grant will be required to target high need areas. And I'm going to leave it up to my panelists to tell you more about the program. Cut it short. Thank you, Senator King. Um, greatly appreciate it. Ms. Wildreyer. Thank you so much, Chair Pinsky and committee members for the chance to support SB 711. I'm Laura Wheeldryer. I'm the Executive Director of the Maryland Family Network. We're a statewide nonprofit organization and the leading voice and champions for young children and their families and caregivers 
and we urge a favorable report on SB 711. The program that Senator King referenced, Go FCC, is a program that was developed by the Child Care Resource Center in Montgomery County, and Maryland Family Network runs the statewide network of child care resource centers. So we have a good statewide purview on efforts that are worthy of replication or expansion in the state. And so actually what I want to tell you today that I'm very excited to be able to say to you is this is an easy one. This is an easy yes. It's a perfect bill for 2021 session. It supports families and high quality early care. It supports women and minority owned businesses. We forget, but women who run childcare are entrepreneurs and many of those women are women of color. And it seeks to promote equity through targeted, targeted support in under-resourced communities. In the work that Montgomery County has done, this has basically given them a double bang for the buck. They focused on women who, for a variety of reasons, may have struggled to find employment. Perhaps they were undereducated, underemployed, they had young children of their own, they weren't native English speakers, and they supported them in becoming business owners and entrepreneurs, but they also targeted specific geographic areas of the county, which were childcare deserts and did not have enough high quality childcare slots for young children. So it benefited the women involved, the neighborhoods, the families, and likely nearby employers whose employees now have childcare options. This modest program, which only demands a modest investment of this body, has produced pretty remarkable results over the last two years. And I will cut it short and not sit here and tell you all the reasons early care and learning is important. I'm going to guess that you know those. I'm also not going to tell you all the ways the last year has decimated the child care industry because I'm going to bet that you know those as well. But it's been really tough times for child care, and this state needs to make a significant long-term investment in supporting child care providers. Thank you so much. We are, urge a favorable report. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Wildreyer. Uh, let's go to Barbara Andrews, followed by Shiny John. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to testify in favor of SB 711, the Family Child Care Pilot Act. I'm Barbara Andrews. I'm the Administrator for Early Childhood Services in Montgomery County Department of Health and Human Services. Um, Laura has very well described the program that we developed in Montgomery County, so I'll just give you a couple of other details. Um, one is that in terms of the loss of family child care, I started in the county nine years ago. We had 1,100 family child care providers. We now have 740. Um, so we started this program a number of years ago to specifically recruit, as Laura Wheeldryer said, in certain areas of the county to find more family child care providers and help them through the process. Um, we did this um, as with a cohort model that we developed. We have an early childhood initiative in Montgomery County, and that helped us to provide some outcomes, specific outcomes. We were supposed to uh, recruit 50 family child care providers in the first year, and we actually recruited 59, all of whom received their registration. Um, we use a cohort model. We provide individualized attention and small group attention. They, they have a year of training they have to do. We take them through that year of training together. They network with each other. We have bilingual staff, which in Montgomery County is essential and in other parts of the state. Um, we also have peer-to-peer -peer mentors who work in the field already and can support and help these providers along and also help us recruit. Uh, and they are bilingual as well. And through this process, we reduce the time to get a registration for family child care from nine to 12 months down to four to six months. Um, that is the level of support that is needed, and I believe that this program will help to do that. Um, we provide specific business supports. We have a lot of different partnerships, but one of our great ones is with the Women's Business Center. We have partnerships with Maryland Family Network. We have partnerships with MSDE, with our permitting department to move things along, et cetera. Um, and we also provide retention and sustainability supports. We help providers through Excels, through accreditation, through the credentialing program, and anything they want to focus on in their career path, which might include a degree at Montgomery College and beyond. Um, since the pandemic, we have focused predominantly on supports. Um, we, all of those family child care providers are still open. Uh, not all of them have children right now because they couldn't recruit because the pandemic started, um, but we are helping them with whatever they can attain and complete um, while they're waiting to bring children into their homes. And we actually recruited four more family homes in the, in, during the pandemic. Um, I have attached a couple of slides that explain to you the recruitment process and the retention, pro retention process. 
Um, and we think that this low FCC model can be beneficial across the state, and we look forward to learning how other jurisdictions implement it, and we're here to help. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. John. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Shiny John. I'm a regulated family child care provider located in Silver Spring. I'm currently published at level three in Maryland's quality rating and improving system excels. And in Maryland child care credentials, I'm currently at level four. I'm pursuing the national accreditation for family child care through the guidance of the resources and reference center and providing support with an accredited mentor. Due to COVID-19, I have no children enrolled in my program. However, I continue marketing my program and updating my information in Locate. The Montgomery Child Care Resources and Reference Center provided me with a roadmap detailing the training requirements to obtain my registration to operate my business in child care. The trainings were offered twice a week during the evenings at their location. I was provided technical support throughout this process. From reviewing the paperwork before submitting it to the Office of Child Care to the pre-visit to assist me with accommodating the learning environment. Before the licensing specialist scheduled a site visit, the Resources and Referral Center had reviewed my paperwork, guided me with the fire inspections, fingerprinting, medical reports, and notarizing forms. Technical assistance was provided in developing my contract and parent handbook, including all my policies and practices. I was provided with excellent resources from the Maryland State Department of Education website, contacted the Women Business Center and had a one-on-one -on -one meeting to formalize my business. Furthermore, the resources and reference center through growing opportunities, family child care, they paid for the first annual registration in the Montgomery County Family Child Care Association. I'm in an improvement path pursuing higher levels of education that will enable me to deliver an equative quality child care program to all the children in the Montgomery County. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. John. Um, uh, Ms. Daniels? Yes, uh, thank you very much, Delegate Pinsky and Delegate Kagan and the rest of the committee for this opportunity to speak in support of Senate Bill 711. My name is Ruby Daniels. I'm the president of Maryland State Family Child Care Association, representing four, over 4,000 family child care providers in Maryland. I'm also a family child care provider in Howard County for over 28 years. During the pandemic, family child care was the preferred choice of most working parents due to the small group size. Family child care also provides a safe learning environment to our youngest learner. Also at the height of the pandemic, family child care providers stepped up and provided child care services to children of essential personnel. Our teachers remained in the classroom for school age children. Over the years, family child care providers have been declining. To put this in context, in 2020, there were 5,091 family child care programs that were open and operating. As of February 2021, only 4,345 were operational. That is a decline of 745, a 14.63% decline in one year which translates to a reduction of nearly 6,000 childcare slots for working parents. As we continue to vaccinate our citizens and prepare for the resumption of schools, most working families will be surprised at the lack of access to childcare. Most working parents, especially women, will not be able to return to work without childcare. Senate Bill 711, Growing Family Childcare Opportunities Pilot Program, will help stop the decline. MSFCCA and our members would like to thank Delegate King for sponsoring this bill. And we would like this committee to give Senate Bill 711 a favorable vote. This bill will save the family child care industry and help working families. Thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it. We too would like to thank uh, Senator King uh, for her work. Um, that completes the uh, testimony. I see no questions. Uh, that completes the bill 711. Thank all the witnesses for, Thank you. And for your patience. Thank you, Senator King. Okay, um, Senator Lee, 733. 
Uh, student okay. data privacy. All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is Senate Bill 733. This, legis this proposed legislation has combined two, combined two common sense measures. The first is a codification of the report and findings from the Student Data Privacy Council. I encourage you to view the link to the final Student Data Privacy Council report. Uh, the second measure is a reporting requirement that the local school systems pass along a simple list of digital education tools that are either approved, prohibited, or third category of not used, but uh, not yet formally approved. Uh, the reporting requirement provision was supported separately as a standalone recommendation from the Maryland Joint Committee on Cybersecurity, Information Technology, and Biotechnology. We sent the drafts uh, the request to the drafters to codify the recommendations of the council report. And while there appear to be some minor inconsistencies, we uh, defer to the final council language as much as possible. Uh, we just wanted to note that uh, this bill was, uh, was drafted before we were able to receive a final copy of the council's report. And that explains some of the inconsistencies, but we'd like to mirror them as much as possible and we have what would love to entertain some amendments. The update of uh, definitions include ensuring that there isn't a backdoor connection to the personal identifying information to be sold to third parties and expands the list of protected categories. The scope of the council was very narrowly focused on the Student Data Privacy Act. So the recommendations do not extend beyond the charge of that body. Uh, however, I felt it was important to include a reporting mechanism on a digital education tools across all 24 jurisdictions. This is just a simply uh, a measure uh, to require uh, MSDE to post information as provided by the local school systems. And this is not, this is not a mandate beyond reporting the digital education tool status. So parents, so parents have a resource to decipher, decipher what is approved and what is not approved in their LSS and perhaps um, what other counties are doing in this space so they can uh, push for the best practices. Uh, for these reasons, I urge a uh, favorable report from uh, my esteemed um, colleagues on this committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Now I'd Thank like you. my witnesses come forward, please. Um, Senator Lee, I don't have any. Um, I have none that were called in. I will take them, um, but I don't have anybody on the witness list. We don't have anyone. What's that? Well, uh, why don't we uh, divert, why don't we go to the witnesses with uh, those with favorable with amendments? Senator Lee, the only person that has signed up favorable with amendments is you, and and you were the lead sponsor. I, that's what I have on the list in front of me. Oh, what do you have the list, Mr. Chairman? Say that again. I'm, I'm sorry, what did you say? The only favorable with amendments signed up is yourself. And oh. you're also the lead sponsor. So I wasn't sure okay. how to handle that. We have written testimony from a number of people, but we have no other individual signed up for oral testimony. Oh, okay. Why don't we just why don't we just use the written testimonies so and submit it to the committee? Also an interest, uh, and we'll, we'll get back to you to work on, um, we, had some, um, we had some experts that were supposed to be witnesses and they had proposed amendments, which we thought were very reasonable in light of the fact that we didn't have the final report when we, ish, when we uh, were asking for the bill to be drafted. So, but in the interest of time and efficiency, uh, we'll speak with the committee later on after the hearings. Okay. Is that acceptable to you, Mr. Chairman? Absolutely, Senator. Thank you for your consideration. Not at all. Thank you. Okay, now we're going to move to Senator Rosapep. He's got three bills before our committee today. We'll start with 668, uh, Good Job Opportunities for High School Graduates. Um, then uh, Facilitating University Transformation, 835. And finally, uh, 895, Student Fees Review and Retention, USM. Um, we will have Senator Rosapep, and he will be followed by Joe D'Amatos, um, 
Dwayne Arbogast, uh, Stephanie Anderson, Christopher Dews. Um, there is no opposition in oral testimony, although there is some in written testimony. You may look at that at your leisure. Uh, Senator Rosenthal, welcome. Thank you very much. I apologize to you and the members of the committee for having three bills before you today. <laughs> Not a good look. I, so we'll try to be brief here. So uh, the Good Job Opportunities Act is basically uh, a continuation of our efforts, your efforts, my efforts, er everyone's efforts over the years to help kids uh, get ahead and get good jobs when they get out of high school, particularly if they're not going to be going to college. And the Kerwin Commission had great recommendations on it, and the legislation we passed does great things in that way. And this is designed to help in that effort. So one thing it does, right now, there are school systems that will pay the fees for kids when they take the SAT test to apply for college, but not pay the fees when they're applying for an apprenticeship or a license to work. And so it says, if a school system is gonna pay for the college uh, entrance exams, they ought to pay for the work entrance exams. That's number one. Number two is most of the school systems in the state use a program called Naviance, they few have a few others, that are basically computer programs, which are great, to design, to help kids kind of explore their future. Naviance, again, was designed primarily to encourage kids to go to college and help them pick out what kind of colleges and what they want to study. Um, and they give a lot of visibility to colleges and they don't give much visibility to work options, to apprenticeship options, to licensing options, to training options. And this just says, if you're going to, if you're going to use these programs to give people college options, you got to give them training and apprenticeship and work options as well. And then it says the CT innovation grant program, which we passed a couple of years ago, which exists and has been giving out grants, which are good, to programs from promote CTE should be focused between now and 2031, which is the goal for implementation uh, of the Kerwin Commission recommendations. That CTE grant money should be focused on meeting the goals of the Kerwin Commission. Pretty straightforward, doesn't cost new money. It just directs the money in a strategic way towards the Kerwin Commission goals. And finally, uh, it provide, the, the bill provides uh, grants of, of $100,000 each to interested local workforce boards at their option to set up systems in which they can use legislation we passed a couple of years ago to allow kids who take the ASVAB uh, test, which is the military recruiting test. Right now, the results of that test are only made available to military recruiters, uh, which is great for the military. Uh, but it ain't as great for the kids who may be looking for other jobs, and it ain't so great for employers who are looking for good data, people, folks, work skills. Uh, the Defense Department worked with us very closely on the original legislation that you passed. They're very cooperative on this because they understand that all kids aren't going to join the military. Uh, and they have, in fact, the Defense Department has its own program showing people other options. And this would simply allow, give startup costs basically to workforce boards to get this system set up so that kids could get access to information about great job opportunities uh, beyond the military uh, with apprenticeship sponsors and employers who would register with a local workforce board to provide quality control. That's what the bill does, Mr. Chairman. Happy to take questions. If you can wait, if, well, you have to wait because they have a few more bills. Let's take your witnesses and then we'll take questions. Sure. Uh, Mr. D'Amatos. Chairman Penske, uh, Vice Chair Kagan, uh, members of the committee. I'm Joe D'Amatos. Many of you know me as the president and the CEO of the Health Facilities Association of Maryland. I rarely testify under another heading, but today it's extraordinarily important. The subject is, um, and that is Senate Bill 668. So I'm testifying today as the chairman of the Maryland Workforce Alliance. Uh, we've been existing, in existence now for three years. We are 35 labor, non-labor, apprenticeship, community college, employer, and trade organizations all aligned with one single purpose. And that is to match unmet job opportunities uh, in, the, in the marketplace with underemployed high school graduates uh, in promising careers in the trades and vocations. And um, in the interest of time, I'll just share uh, two things about this bill. Uh, Senator Rosapep did an outstanding job unpacking it just now. What excites us in the alliance about this bill is that it extends uh, the testing preparation program that we already have in Maryland with no new dollars 
and aligns those programs and support of those testing programs for Mar young Marylanders who may not be college bound, but may find extraordinarily rewarding careers in the trades or in vocations. We also incredibly are appreciative of the use of the ASVAB test and the scores for non-military placement in the trades or vocational programs. So for these reasons, the Maryland Workforce Alliance and our 35 labor and non-labor, employer and non-labor members support Senate Bill 668. Uh, thank you, uh, Mrs. D'Amatos. Uh, now, uh, Dr. Arbogast, welcome to Education, Health, and Environment. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, welcome, Chairman Pinsky and the committee. Uh, I'm a longtime public ed school educator in Anne Arundel and Prince George's County, and now I have a program in Montgomery County. I will tell you that schools do a wonderful job of connecting colleges to kids' interest. What this bill does is that opens up the interest to employers. And what I've discovered through my program in Montgomery County is that the connection between employers and students um, ha receives a lot of barriers through the school. And students connect with employers completely outside of school. Schools love to talk to employers, but the connection between employers and students is really broken. What I see this bill doing is allowing employers and students to communicate. And, and if this bill worked to full efficiency, imagine a very talented 11th grade student going out to the mailbox and getting mail from University of Maryland, Cornell, University of Delaware, and Northrop Grumman and Lockheed Martin about the internships and apprenticeships that are available. Currently, that doesn't exist, and this bill opens the door for that. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Arbogast, and I can attest he has been a lifelong uh, contributor to education excellence uh, throughout the state. Thank you, Dwayne. Thank you, Paul. Uh, let's uh, have Stephanie Anderson followed by Christopher Dews. Uh, is Ms. Anderson with us? Ms. Anderson is in the room. There she is. She's unmuted now. Just to clarify this, I am Stephanie Anderson. However, I'm not testifying on this bill. There must be another Stephanie Anderson because I'm SB 845. Okay. Uh, are you with the Mally Miles? I'm not. I'm with the heating and air conditioning contractors of Marin. Maryland. Okay. Chairman, Stephanie's uh, with us. Bill, so I'm not go. testifying. We're I'm good sorry, go. uh, Joe. Stephanie was with us. We're good to go on that. Okay. Uh, how about Christopher Dews? Perfect. My name is Christopher Dews, and I'm a policy advocate for the Job Opportunities Task Force, um, where our mission is to help lower wage workers advance to higher wage jobs. We support uh, Senate Bill 668 as a means of ensuring that future workers and job seekers have access to strong and stable employment post-graduation. As many of you already know, uh, according to a recent Walla Hub study in 2020, Maryland ranks number two in education uh, in the nation. Uh, <laughs> second only to Massachusetts for the most well-educated populace with 37.9% of Marylanders having at least a bachelor's degree, uh, down from actually 41% in 2014. Now the thing is, is 37.9% uh, is of course still 60, what, 62% shy of uh, Maryland's workforce. So many Marylanders do not have a, a bachelor's degree. And so many of them are gonna go into trades or, or basically positions that don't require a degree. And also I wanna address the, just quickly, the idea that uh, the average student loan debt in Maryland is 32,000. So what we're seeing, $32,000. So what we are seeing is that more and more Marylanders, specifically those of lower income are, are getting themselves into the trades. What we like about this bill is that, um, as was already mentioned, is that uh, it transitions a lot of the, the energy that is currently in motion for getting kids uh, connected to colleges, takes the same energy and puts Puts it into the trades as well. JLTF runs a pre-apprenticeship construction training program, Project Jumpstart, where we train specifically city residents in um, electrical, plumbing, as well as carpentry, and we get them full-time employment that way without any debt, without anything having to be paid back. And so we see this bill as actually a really good opportunity to channel um, a lot of work, a lot of young Marylanders and give them more opportunities to have greater access to employment and also kind of kill the paradigm of saying, if you don't go to college, that you know you're, you're, not, you're not doing life correctly. Um, even though, yeah, I mean, since the vast majority of Marylanders aren't, aren't going to be in that direction in the first place. So we just see this bill as, as, a, as a great move to increase employment opportunities. I also want to quickly discuss the Earn Grant Employment Advancement Right Now Act, $1 into earn is $17 of economic impact 
back to the community. And, and, and what EARN does is basically connect employers where their skills gaps are uh, uh, to actual employees who can get out there and do the work and train them for that work. So we see this as an opportunity to uh, have funding go into areas where people can be trained into these specific fields, uh, where the jobs and opportunities are, where the apprenticeships are, and basically uh, <laughs> make life great for themselves. And so for those reasons, we urge a favorable report. We like what, what it's doing with the funding, and we thank uh, Senator Rosa Pell for putting this together. For those reasons, we urge a favorable report. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you very much, um, Mr. Dews. Uh, there is no opposition signed up. Uh, Senator Carrozza. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Rosa Pep, for this um, bill. And just, I want to understand, I have three uh, uh, technical high schools in my district, and we have really been trying to um, strengthen the um, relationships between the local employers and um, the technical high schools. So I would, I just would like to better understand how does this work in, how, how does this actually work in reality? where you're either gonna strengthen these matches and, and especially in the area, we have a huge um, construction um, shortage, uh, workforce shortage as well. So I just wanna know how this actually works uh, since I know there's some ongoing efforts going on right now. Yeah, I mean, they're really just four, there are four different pieces of the bill and there are four different ways to strengthen it. We're not trying to create something new here. We're trying to strengthen existing programs. So the first one says, we don't, we don't want to disincentivize kids from taking uh, exams that would get them into a non-credit training program. Right now, there are school systems that pay for your SAT exam fees, but don't pay for your uh, job application fees or your apprenticeship fees. So it's putting, it's a level playing field. You can think of it just as low. So that's one. It sounds small, but it's real for people. And it sends a message that we support one and we don't support the other. So that's one. Two, the same thing with Naviance, which is these databases that schools use. It's sort of like Dr. Abergas said, you see lots of stuff in there about all your college opportunities and very little about your job opportunities. And so it's just getting into a system that already exists, information about the job opportunities and the non-college uh, training opportunities. And then it is focusing the CTE grant money that is already in law on our Kerwin goals. Instead of just dribbling out money here and there in response to who wants to do what, it would, it would say the money has to be given as part of the strategy of Kerwin, because Kerwin, as you know, all, all the members of the community know very well, has a very strategic plan about moving to youth apprenticeships and CT completions for all kids who want them by 2030. But to do that, we need to invest in the school side of this, and that's what the CTE innovation grants are about. And then finally is the ASFAB, is to get the workforce boards up and running. Uh, they're interested in doing it, but it takes some startup costs basically. And so it's just some startup costs to get work. We, I think we have 10 or 12 workforce boards around the state. They each would have to do it. And so it'd be startup costs to get them going on providing the information about kids' skills, which are tested in the ASVAB, provide them to civilian employers in, in addition to uh, the military. Thank you. Further questions for any of the panelists? Seeing none, uh, that concludes um, Senator Rosa Pep's 668. I'm going to uh, hand it off to the Vice Chair, Madam Vice Chair. Mr. Chairman, Senator Rosa Pep, you are continuing with Senate Bill 835, facilitating university transformations by unifying reductions in emissions act, future. And I love acronyms uh, when they're when they're de defined. So welcome uh, back again. After you is going to be Reese Barrett from PERG, uh, the Student Climate Action Coalition from the Public Research, Public Interest Research Group, then Robin Jessica Clark with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation and Margaret Holland, UMBC faculty. So please kick us off, Senator Rosen. Sure. So we have lots of great experts on here, so I won't go much in, into the details, but the essence of it is uh, the University of Maryland, University of Southern Maryland, has been a leader in sustainability in lots of ways. Uh, but as we all know from our discussion on the floor today, uh, we need to do more. And so basically, student leaders uh, in the university system uh, worked with uh, Delegate Solomon in the uh, House to put together this bill to move the ball forward on what the uh, university system does uh, in terms of renewable energy. And I cross-filed the bill. That's it. 
Well, that was beautifully succinct. And we look forward to hearing from your uh, young experts here. Uh, Reese Barrett with Mary Perk Student Climate Coalition. Welcome. As the lead proponent, you get up to five minutes. Good afternoon, um, Chairman Pinsky and Senators of the Education, Health and Environmental Affairs Committee. My name is Reese Barrett and I'm a very proud Marylander. I was born in Annapolis and have spent my entire life on the Severn River, crabbing and water skiing and rafting up on the 4th of July with my siblings and parents. My family is built on a foundation of sharing time outdoors, and I know a lot of you can say the same. Currently, I'm a sophomore at the University of Maryland College Park. I graduated as valedictorian from Severna Park High School in Anne Arundel County, and I'm now majoring in chemical engineering with a minor in sustainability studies. I'm a straight A student with a full academic scholarship, and I do research on campus because I'm hoping to someday earn a PhD and work as a professor. I've also dedicated hours and hours to climate activism because I don't feel as if I have a choice. The climate crisis threatens everything I hold dear, including my river and all of the memories I've made on the water with the people I love the most. Climate change is already impacting the Maryland environment and its citizens. Sea level is rising faster than average because our land is also sinking. Communities around the state from Ellicott City to Baltimore to Annapolis to the Eastern Shore are dealing with more frequent and more severe flooding. More intense storm events and wet, warmer water temperatures cause algal blooms and dead zones which harm the health of our beloved Chesapeake and the livelihoods of those who depend on it. To mitigate the impacts of climate change we need aggressive carbon neutrality timelines. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change says that to limit temperature increases to 1.5 to 2 degrees, we must have global annual emissions by 2030. To reach these goals, university must act now. For the future, facilitate meaningful emissions reductions rapidly and affordably, benefits for the state, and still allow plants to be operated until the end of their life. Universities understand the science, but there is no clear plan to implement strategies based on their values. UMD is in the process of renewing their contract for their on-campus natural gas plant. There has been no indication that the new 30-year agreement will include meaningful emissions reductions. If schools are not willing to make tangible plans, we need a state-level commitment. Our natural environment and the well-being of our Maryland communities is intrinsically linked. Many of our universities, like the University of Maryland and the University of Baltimore, are located in communities of color, which already experience environmental racism and are on the front lines of climate change. As the climate crisis escalates, phenomena like natural disasters will continue to devastate marginalized communities first. We've seen that air pollution and heat islands, exacerbated by climate change, lead to public health problems like asthma, which have worsened the effects of COVID-19. It is too late to reverse the effects of environmental racism had on the pandemic, but we must prevent this from happening again. Science shows that we are at the tipping point for climate change. Action must be taken now to prevent, protect these communities before irreparable damage is done. A key component of the FUTURE Act is this commitment to marginalized communities. Our bill includes provisions to help lessen this disparity through local and environmental justice requirements for offsets. Local offset projects could be in the form of a community garden in a food desert, a tree planting program, or upgrading local schools to electric buses. Our bill would also ensure that all schools have an office of sustainability. Education is a fundamental part of addressing any social, environmental or economic issue. By supporting environmental education with sustainability staff, we can create greater understanding of climate science, energy consumption, and environmental injustices so that our public universities can continue to produce well-rounded and well-informed students. UMD's Office of Sustainability supports the University Sustainability Council, which advises the president on the Climate Action Plan. At the request of students, the council investigated and endorsed a plan in 2020 that would bring UMD to carbon neutrality by 2025. This endorsement demonstrates that the 2035 neutrality deadline in the Future Act is reasonable, achievable, and forgiving. A 2050 deadline is acceptable. The Future Act includes hundreds of from 11 schools around the state, and we're growing. Five Maryland higher institutions have endorsed the bill, along with numerous groups focused on social and climate justice within and outside our campuses. We've also seen support with amendments from the very universities this bill will affect. The future leaders of our state support this legislation. It is only right that our state's public universities show leadership as well. It's true that taking action on climate is not an easy or cheap thing to do. Economists say that the cost of inaction, however, is about $50 per ton of CO2 emissions. Our universities are in the perfect position to be leaders on this issue for a small fraction of that price. Schools represent both their own researchers who are at the forefront of climate science and also their students who are spending tens of thousands of dollars on tuition. We are investing in our universities and they, in return, need to invest in our futures. As adults, and especially as people in government, you have a responsibility and a moral obligation to leave this world a better place than you found it. 
I want you to take a hard look at the cost of inaction, and I want you to tell me that this bill costs too much. It is past time to act, but you can start today here by taking real action that leaves a legacy telling your children and grandchildren, people like me, that you love them enough to protect the planet they will inherit. Thank you. Oh my gosh. Ms. Barrett, you got in just under your five minute time and no one, you're an excellent speed reader. That was very impressive, both in the substance and in delivery. Thank you. Um, Rob and Jessica Clark, Chesapeake Bay Foundation. Welcome, you have up to two and a half minutes. Thank you so much, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Um, Rob and Jessica Clark here, Maryland staff attorney with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation in support of SB 835. Um, you've heard the overview of the bill um, setting our Maryland higher education institutions on a timeline for carbon neutrality um, for different types of carbon emissions. Um, greenhouse gas contains nitrogen and um, you know, when nitrogen, when the, when the rain falls through the, the air and those, and those nitrogen emissions, um, they fall into the bay and they contribute to algal blooms, which, which then can create dead zones that essentially smother a lot of bay life, everything from the grasses in the bay to the crabs, to the fish, et cetera. About a third of the nitrogen pollution in the bay is coming in this way. It's coming through the air. So it's a major concern. Um, I know you all know the phase three watershed implementation plan is going to require the state to really um, clean up and reduce the amount of nitrogen going into the bay. Based on where we were at the midpoint assessment, we've got about eight to nine million pounds more of nitrogen to clean up. Well, climate change is making that task even more difficult. Now, because of climate and because of the greenhouse gas emissions, we've got to, to add an additional million pounds um, to, that, to that challenge of nitrogen. So um, we appreciate the legislation's approach to reducing greenhouse gases here locally. We also like the idea um, and the encouragement and incentives that are, that are embedded here that would require carbon offsets, a certain percent of the carbon offsets to be created locally in Maryland. And it would also require some of those offsets to be based on projects that have an environmental justice tie-in. <laughs> Chesapeake Bay Foundation does a lot of tree plantings that could be the, the product for those carbon offsets. Um, we have had initial talks with the University of Maryland of figuring out a program whereby students could be verifying and monitoring how much carbon is being captured by different local projects and thus learning, and also um, then allowing the university to purchase credits from those very products. Robin, I need to wrap up your testimony. That's it. Um, for those reasons, we support the legislation. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you for taking the time and being with us. Um, colleagues, I just want to be clear, there is no opposition testimony at all. So let's uh, shift to Margaret. It looks like Maggie Holland, UMBC faculty. Welcome to Education, Health, and Environmental Affairs. Great. It's Thanks. It's been happy. such a pleasure to be a part of a session like this and listen to the other bills before the committee today. And as a lifelong Marylander, multi-generational Marylander, it's my first time providing testimony in front of a uh, committee. Um, and so uh, I really welcome the opportunity and I thank you senators for your attention to this bill. Um, I'm Dr. Maggie Holland. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Geography and Environmental Systems at UMBC. So I'm here to speak as a university educator, a researcher, and a mentor to students, students who have spoken well here and have really done the work to bring this bill before you. Um, in light of others who have provided testimony, let me just highlight, I'll, I'll try to make three main points. One, this pushes this bill, SB 835 pushes the bill to accelerate and reach net zero emissions by 2035. This is in line with keep, keeping global warming to below two degrees Celsius. It's also in line with what the new presidential administration is trying to push in terms of net zero electricity by 2035. So it brings Maryland, who's already a leader, right, among states in reducing carbon emissions into line with even more aggressive targets. And to maintain our leadership, we really need to set that bar 
um, a more aggressively, right? And, and what better place to try to do that and to innovate and to showcase that innovation than our universities and set the stage for that kind of action to happen. Um, I also, have, others have also pointed out that this bill offers specific guidance on carbon offsets. I've done a lot of research related to programs that focus on carbon offsets actually internationally. Um, I do research on deforestation in the tropics, and there's a lot of work tied to carbon, carbon offset projects there. And I realized that they're not a panacea. Um, they are one really important tool in the climate action toolbox. And we are at a stage in action where we need all the tools in the toolbox. And so this is one of those measures that universities can take to help meet those emissions targets. And I'm really thrilled to see these specific um, reduction goals and carbon offset carve outs tied to making a difference in our own backyard, right? Making a difference in terms of Chesapeake Bay, aligning that with Chesapeake Bay conservation goals, and also making a difference in terms of environmental injustices and trying to address those at the same time. So let's think about the amazing co-benefits. Dr. Holland, could you wrap up your testimony, please? Your time yeah. is expired. So finally, I'm here to support the next generation and all of my students who have expressed a sincere distress about Thank climate you. change and yet are shifting into action and trying to Thank bring you. that action before us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Holland. You did a great job. I hope you will return often and share your testimony. If you're a native Marylander, it was time for you to join us uh, with helping us legislate. So thank you very much. Colleagues, just for the record, other than informational testimony from Anna Yates at St. Mary's College, we have favorable from two page, a page and a half from uh, Greenbelt Climate Action, Sunrise Movement, Howard County, Maryland Legislative Coalition, uh, MLC, I don't know who that is, Climate Justice Wing, Environment Maryland, many others. So check out the, uh, the that. There was no opposition. I see no questions. I actually have one question for Senator Rosapep. There is an amendment in the folder, and I don't think I heard you mention it. It's got your name on it. So I assume you want us to carefully consider the amendment. You are muted. Not just carefully considered. I'd love you to adopt it. Adopt it. Okay. I don't know if maybe I missed it that you didn't reference it. No, I, 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 I didn't reference it. It's pretty technical. Okay. All right. Appreciate that. Uh, I see Senator Croza has a question and then we will wrap up this hearing. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Um, I guess my question would be for the uh, sponsor, Senator Rosa Pepp. Um, trying to, to catch up on this bill. Is this um, something that um, you mentioned uh, that we're considering the uh, climate change bill on the Senate floor now, and then you mentioned this bill, so it was a little. I was, I was just saying they both deal with climate change. That's all I was, was saying. Okay, so. Um, They're not tied together. Okay, so this is just a, a separate bill that. Totally, totally. Yeah, yeah. I apologize for going off track. I was trying to just be cheerful. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, Senator. There you go. <laughs> All right. I see no other questions. So let us complete the hearing on Senate Bill 835. Thank you, Senator Rosapep. And you have one more before us, Senate Bill 895, University System of Maryland Student Fees Review and Retention. And before we kick off the hearing, I want you all to see, oh, I don't know that you're going to be able to see it. There we go. Uh, I have a TERP advocate network uh, pin that was in my drawer that I just uh, encountered. So uh, so lots of advocates today, but uh, Senator Rosa Pepp, why don't you kick us off and then I'll announce who the other witnesses are. Sure, that's fine. You will see a pattern here. Both of these bills have come from students at the University of Maryland. Uh, I think I can go without being contradicted that I have more college students in my district probably than most, most of my colleagues. Uh, and they're really smart. Uh, and so this is a different issue. This is not about the climate. Uh, this is about um, student fees. Uh, the Student Government Association came to me with this issue. Uh, as you know, um, the universities get funding from a variety of places. They get a lot of money from the taxpayer through the General Assembly. Um, they get money from tuition uh, from their students. They get money from grants. Um, and they get money from fees. And some of the fees are applied to everybody who's on campus. Some of them are applied um, just to students. Some of them are applied to in students in certain situations and not in others. 
it gets very complicated very quickly. And it differs tremendously by campus. And I remember this when I was on the Board of Regents. Uh, and the Board of Regents has to approve these fees. But one of the things that university has done over the years, which I applaud, is consult with students on fees that would apply to students. It's like normal, you know, democratic uh, uh, process. Now, the students don't make the decisions on the fees other than if they don't want to come there and pay the fees, they don't come there and pay the fees in the marketplace. But um, they do have input on it. And so on a regular basis, uh, when the administration in a campus wants to increase fees, add fees, make different fees, whatever they want to do, uh, they consult with the relevant uh, student organization. And it varies by campus uh, for different kinds of fees. Um, why is this an issue and why did the um, SGA come forward and ask me to introduce this bill? Because uh, there have been issues, not a lot of issues. Uh, there was one sort of more, larger issue than others at the University of Maryland about a year or so ago uh, about the campus deciding to take money that was raised with a purpose in mind, consulted with students, and the money's going to go for this. And because of fiscal problems, which we all understand, they decided to use the money for that instead of for this. And the students can tell you more about the details if you want to get into it. But so the essence of this bill was simply to say, look, uh, when you say you're going to spend it on X um, and you want to change it to spend it on Y, at least come talk to us. Uh, tell us what you want to do. Explain it to us. I mean, and, and the vice chair is like, you know, Madam Transparency. Uh, and so this is like, like right in line with this. Uh, the original bill that they asked me to introduce uh, was mandatory. And the university administration objected to that. And so we worked very hard with uh, both the system and with the University of Maryland College Park to come up with the language that is before you. Once again, I got like two little technical amendments uh, for clarity, but the substance of what's in the bill uh, has been agreed to uh, by the university system and by the University of Maryland College Park and by the SGA. Happy to take questions. Thank you, Senator Rosdepep, appreciate that. Um, the lead witness uh, is someone I haven't seen since I was in Iowa last January, back when we were able to travel. So Ben Bateman is gonna kick us off up to five minutes, followed by Emily Berry, Max Hancock, Leslie Ireland, and Joanne Bauman. So Ben, good to see you again. Welcome to EHE. Good to see you, Senator. My name is Ben Bateman, and I'm the Director of Government Affairs for the Student Government Association at the University of Maryland College Park. I want to say thanks to Chair Pinsky, Vice Chair Kagan, and all the members of the Education, Health, and Environmental Affairs Committee for the opportunity to share our thoughts on this important bill, and to Senator Rosepep for sponsoring the legislation, which will improve transparency in how University System of Maryland schools spend student fee revenues. It is intended to prevent further violations of USM policy regarding student fees as occurred at the College Park campus, and which I will explain throughout my testimony. The USM Board of Regents defines student fees in two ways. First, mandatory fees, which are charged to all students and should provide revenue for the supportive operations that are available and for use of the entire student body. And second, non-mandatory fees, which are charged to subsets of students enrolled in certain programs or majors that carry additional expenses, such as dining for dorm residents or engineering students. These fees are charged for specific reasons and with specific intentions for how they are ultimately spent by the departments or units that requested them. In 2019, UMD's state funding was reduced by nearly 4 million for fiscal year 2020. In May of 2019, senior university administrators announced that 5% of all campus fund balances would be moved into an account that would be spent at the sole discretion of the chief financial officer. This communication, along with other documents that I will reference later on, are included in my written testimony in your packets. However, this reversion collected nearly $23 million. This included over three and a half million from accounts that were funded either in part or in full by student fees, including the student union, campus housing, and the campus recreation facilities. In many cases, 80 to 100% of collected funds were revenues derived from student fees. As a result, many of these departments had to postpone renovations and delay services. Some departments were in fact concerned that they would have to request an increase to their student fee in order to make up lost revenues. Even department directors have expressed concern that the reversion sets a precedent for the university to use student fees in offsetting losses from other revenue sources. In October of 2019, another email from university administrators noted what projects and initiatives were financed by the discretionary fund. These included administrative research costs, stormwater management improvements, and capital expenditures such as a new roof and HVAC for academic buildings, 
construction of the new Cole Fieldhouse Sports Research Center, and economic development in the Greater College Park area. Although important priorities for the university, these are not projects that student fee revenues should be spent on. Nowhere close to all students will benefit from the Cole Fieldhouse Athletic Complex, and students who paid $45 for the Performing Arts and Cultural Center fee should expect that it goes to that purpose, not something else. Millions of dollars in student fees were approved, paid, and collected for specific department operations and services. And these were diverted to projects that are not accessible and available to the students who paid the fees. Construction projects, administrative costs, and other initiatives should not be prioritized at the detriment of the services that students were told that they were charged for. This inappropriate siphoning of funding meant to serve students in specific ways violates the fee setting process, USM policy, and prevents students from receiving the services that they pay for. This bill requires that student fees be spent in the way that they were intended to be spent when the fee was originally requested. We believe that this is a common sense measure. We also understand that the system's institutions have complicated fiscal frameworks and are in an impossibly difficult financial situation at the moment. In response to this, the bill allows institutions to spend student fee revenues in a manner beyond the intended purpose of the fee, as long as the institution's student fee review committee reviews the exception. This provision should ease any concerns that administrators across the system have about controlling their institution's finances. As you can see in my supporting documents, departments funded by both mandatory and non-mandatory fees were significantly affected. We've enjoyed working with College Park administrators on the friendly amendments that Senator Rosa Pep is proposing to this bill, which will ensure that it is not limited in scope to specific fees or types of fees. The reality is units across campus were severely hurt by this improper action by the university, an action for which they have apologized for. Because this went against the system's own policy with no accountability, we believe it must be remedied through change to the law. I would also like to add that an unfortunate recurring theme that we have heard from students at the USM Student Council is the lack of real and consistent student involvement in the student fee process, as it's described in system policy and is codified in Section H1 of this bill. While the bill deals with financial and procedural concerns, the core issue is one of transparency, and I believe that is something that all members of the USM community should appreciate. Ladies and gentlemen, I urge you to give a favorable, favorable report on SB 895. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ben. Great job. Appreciate you. And next up, uh, Emily Berry, Residence Hall Association, University of Maryland College Park. Welcome, Ms. Berry. Hello, thank you to the chair and the committee for considering this legislation. My name is Emily Berry and I'm the president of the Residence Hall Association, which represents the voice of all on-campus students at the University of Maryland. I have held an RHA seat on several fee review committees at the University of Maryland over the past two plus years. Despite this, I was not informed about the reversion until it was too late to give input. In the following months, discussions with directors in and outside the Committee for the Review of Student Fees revealed how much this loss impacted their plans to serve students. We heard many times that if this budget loss continues, then departments will have to take on debt and halt projects crucial to the well-being of the student body. RHA students are especially involved in the review of the proposed housing, dining, and parking permit fees. We spend weeks diligently reviewing the projects that student money will be used towards. The reversion meant that instead of what they were approved for, these funds were taken for alternative projects. Resident life and residential facilities had to deter the renovations of two halls, having a significant impact on their operations and the strategic housing plan that exists to expand housing opportunities and housing quality for college students. Note that, for example, UMD still has many halls without air conditioning, and as someone who lived in one for three years, I know how important making these changes are to helping future students in their wellness and academic success. Dining and transportation also indicated uncertainty about the negative impact future fund losses could have. This greatly concerns me. On March 3rd, 2020, the RHA Senate body voted unanimously on behalf of the resident student population to condemn the universities for its reversion and require a discussion of potential future reversion plans in CRSF to protect the integrity of student fees and their intended use. SB 895 achieves this goal, ensuring that departments will not have to halt or cut important projects due to unanticipated losses. This is not a debate of which projects are most important but rather a question of whether university stakeholders deserve to have a voice in the way fees that are approved for certain purposes are ultimately spent. 
If the University of Maryland is able to continue taking fund for alternative purposes with zero transparency, it will likely have dire consequences on the ability of departments to provide the services that are vital to both on and off campus student success and well being. I strongly urge a favorable report today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Berry. Great job. Max Hancock, welcome from Frostburg State University Student Government. Good to have you here. You have up to two and a half minutes. Thank you so much. <clears throat> now, um, as you've heard, my name is Max Hancock and I am a Senator in the Student Government at Frostburg State University. I'd first like to thank Chair Pinsky and the committee as a whole for the opportunity to discuss this bill. It's my utmost honor to testify here today. Uh, as my constituents and I consider the passage of Senate Bill 895 key, for creating transparency and goodwill across the university system of Maryland's various campuses. The process by which USM student fees are determined is one that should include students. Whether mandatory or program specific, university system of Maryland policy dictates that representative advisory boards be given the opportunity to review fee decisions. This policy theoretically establishes a universal mission of transparency, but that mission isn't actively pursued. So while my colleagues at the University of Maryland identified an instance of misspent departmental fees, I wanna focus my attention on a different provision of this bill. Frostburg doesn't even have the luxury of student participation in the fees process as policy suggests we should. When our student government tried to get involved in the fees process, this is what we encountered. So first I asked the university's director of student activities who suggested that I reach out to the university's vice president of student affairs and he didn't have any information. However, he thought that the board was generally composed of the student government's executive branch, so I should ask them. And I did. And I got a nice email back from the SGA's vice president saying she didn't know of any such review board, but would ask the university vice president of finance about it. The vice president of finance has not returned any of my emails or requests to meet. So despite being perhaps the highest authority on the matter of student fees at our campus, he is entirely inaccessible to students. This is not the transparent process that Maryland students were promised. Frostburg saw a nearly 20% increase in fees from 2016 to 2019. Students were not consulted directly for this, which is a travesty for a school that prides itself on being accessible to all. Frostburg State is a low income community and we can't endure many more attacks to the well being of our most vulnerable students. So Senate Bill 895 represents an opportunity to enforce the standards of respect and financial sustainability that recent years have seen neglected. Without these bill, this bill's protection, students have no reason to trust the process that demands they surrender their money for unspecified purposes. It's a step towards a more considerate future. Thus, the student body of Frostburg State requests a favorable report on Senate Bill 895 for the good of our education and our community. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hancock, for your testimony. Uh, next up, Leslie Ireland. Uh, Ms. Ireland, you're, when you signed up, you didn't give an organization. So if you can just tell us if you're representing an organization or are testifying as an individual, welcome to EHE. You may unmute and begin your testimony. Hi, my name is Ireland, and I um, am the former student body president of oh. the University of Maryland College Park. So I am testifying on behalf of myself, but as the former student body president. Perfect. I wanna start by thanking you all for being here for this hearing, which is the result of over two years of work by the UMD Student Government Association. Throughout the student fee approval process, students are told time and time again that our role, which is supposed to contribute to shared governance, is only advisory. We are told that our work to best represent the student body is only as valuable as administrators decide. However, what is most frustrating is the total lack of information, clarity and transparency regarding ex what exactly the student fee committees are supposed to be advising and approving. When I found out about their version in the fall of 2019, it was not through notice by campus leadership before they took $61,000 from the SGA and student organizations or the total of 3 million from student fee sustained departments. I found out in private meetings with department heads who shared how it was going to detrimentally impact their budgets and ultimately students by having to dramatically increase their fees to continue to provide services. I then spent months gaining clarity on who had made this decision and why. I had countless meetings with administrators where they pointed fingers at each other and in some meetings it emerged that perhaps they should not have taken money from student fees, but that it was too late now. We had meetings with department heads, some who didn't even know their reversion had happened who, who, or who shared with us how it would negatively impact their departments. It was striking to discover that there had not been a comprehensive look 
or even questions asked about whether this would ultimately negatively impact student services or raise student fees. It was even more striking that the decision maker, former Provost Rankin, refused to meet with me or other students on the issue or offer any further explanation about how she had come to this decision. We still don't know a lot of things about the reversion. We don't know if or when it will happen again, whether student fees or affordability will be taken into account, who makes the decision on which projects will be funded and which will be cut, and a whole list of other questions that further prevent student leaders from being able to make informed decisions during the student fee process. Ultimately, this bill is about transparency, about giving the student, review, the student fee review committees at each institution full information about where these fees go and how they are used. It's about creating a model of shared governance, real shared governance, and it is about ensuring students understand the fees and services that they are paying for. Despite there being cl plenty of questions around the student fee process and their version, there is one thing we do know. This method of budgeting through a lack of transparency can only continue to hurt students. That is why this bill is so important and I urge you to give it a favorable report. I'm happy Thank to answer you. any questions about my testimony. Thank you so much. And I'm very sorry for transposing your name. So Ireland Leslie, not Leslie Ireland. I suspect no. I was the first, but- uh, Friends all the time. <laughs> sure, I'm so sorry, Ms. Leslie. Thank you for your testimony and thank you for your past leadership of student government. Um, so normally there's only one uh, one other witness, uh, which was Ms. Leslie, but uh, Ms. Dr. Bauman, we are delighted to have you here as our bonus witness, but to be clear, there's no opposition, but it's terrific to hear from you and it's it's always a pleasure to see you here as the Senior Vice Chancellor for Academic and Student Affairs. If you could add your views on this and then we will wrap up this bill. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vice uh, Chair Kagan, Chair Pinsky, and the members of the committee. As Vice Chair said, my name is Dr. Joanne Boffman. I'm the Senior Vice Chancellor for Academic and Student Affairs. You have our written testimony in which we support this bill with the amendments. Um, as you know, USM mission includes providing comprehensive range of high quality, accessible and affordable educational opportunities. And as you have heard, a value central to the functioning of our system is that of shared governance. So we include our constituencies in the process that provide input to the Board of Regents. In the assignment of student fees, you've heard the Board of Regents has a policy that clearly indicates that student consultation is required. Each campus must attest to and document the process that they use to engage with student leaders and representatives. Each year, the campuses must send forward their plan st fee structure for final approval by the board. The chancellor, the board of regents, and the state hold the university presidents responsible for managing the universities, including the budget. Certainly with significant consultation of all stakeholders, but at the end of the day, the presidents are responsible for the financial results and must be allowed to maintain that ultimate authority. We believe the proposed amendments clarify all of these points in transparency, shared governance, and decision making. But especially in these extraordinary times, everybody has had to watch their budgets more closely than ever. You've already heard that our budgets were tightened significantly. Our universities, like our students that we serve, have had to manage significant and rapid changes in the money that we are taking in, as well as the way we are spending it, including extra costs associated with the pandemic. We therefore understand the need to be even more transparent with regard to the fees collected from the students. We sincerely appreciate all the work that has already gone into this engagement with the student and their individual campuses as well as working more with the University System of Maryland. The USM therefore agrees, certainly with the intent of Senate Bill 895, and agree that fee setting should be an inclusive process as is required by our policies and clarified in Senate Bill 895. We therefore support 895 with the amendments. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Boffman. Uh, good to have you here. Uh, there is a an Ellen Herps University System of Maryland who signed up as favorable with amendment. But yes, uh, Vice room. Chair, um, Vice Chancellor uh, for Admin and Finance, Ellen Herbst was the other witness. Yes. She got called to a Senate uh, capital uh, uh, capital hearing. Okay. Um, at the same time, so I in fact included the couple of points that she was going to make Perfect. in my testimony. Thank you so much. All right, uh, there's a question from Senator Washington. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, thank you again, all the students for your testimony. Um, 
I was a student, we actually had a student union. We formed a student union at my state school. And um, there was actually a mid-semester uh, fee increase. Uh, and uh, we actually took the state to court and won. But anyway, so um, this was back in the 80s. Um, so, uh, but I, I actually wanted to um, thank Dr. Boffman for, you know, just owning it. Uh, and, 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 and just, and, and, and your willingness to do that. But I guess, um, on behalf of maybe, um, uh, Hancock and some of the others, you know, if, who is at the end of the day, who's accountable, you're saying it's the policy, right? So if we have institutions, maybe they're not working the policy or, you know, it doesn't have to be on the website. I mean, how does student governments or, or an individual student know uh, that they have this right to participate. And if it's not happening the way that they're expected, who, who do they go to? Who should they go to? So I mean, am I capturing that, um, um, Max Hancock? Am I, am I getting that? Is that a fair question? Yes. Okay, anyway, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. I, I see Th thank you very much. And as you heard, the, the students, in fact, talk to their own universities first. We also have a system-wide student council that I meet with on at least once a month. I meet with the uh, leadership of that student council in between those times. So there is also that avenue, and I hope that we use that avenue more, that if, in fact, a campus is not being appropriately responsive, we could, in fact, work with the students going to their campus leadership to, in fact, engage in more uh, conversation and, and certainly with Senator Rosa Pep over the years, we've had many uh, conversations um, with this with the system and with the campuses together. Um, but uh, you can you can rest assured that we have heard uh, these students and we will be following up. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Senator Happy Washington. Thank you. I suspect that you are not the only one of us who also has stories related to this from our long ago days. So thank you. Uh, I see no other questions. Senator Rosa Pav, thank you very much for all three of these bills. It's good to have you back in EHA. Take care. Thank you. Thanks back an awful lot. Hearing on Senate Bill 895. Okay, Senator Hester, we're back to Senator Hester Day. We've got the next two from her. We'll kick off with Senate Bill 770. Education, Technology Resources Funding, Ending the Digital Divide Act. Um, and you will kick us off and, <coughs> excuse me, I was trying God to- bless you, voice. Madam Chair. <laughs> Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Wesley Watts Jr. is going to be the lead proponent followed by Sean Looney of Comcast. So uh, please go ahead, Senator Hester. Thank you very much, Ma Madam Chair, members of the committee um, for your consideration of Senate Bill 770. You know, for years we have been aware of our education systems inequities, particularly around the digital divide. And unfortunately, in the wake of the move to online schooling, you know, many of these inequities have been highlighted by the pandemic. According to a survey conducted by Pew Research in early April of last year, 40% of the students answered that they would have to use public Wi-Fi to finish their schoolwork due to the lack of reliable internet. And 36% indicated that they would not be able to complete schoolwork because they do not have access to a computer at home. Um, at the beginning of the pandemic, we saw a major effort uh, across our school systems uh, to address this by purchasing millions of dollars worth of Chromebooks um, and hotspots to maintain that connectivity. And while we continue to see an influx of funding from the federal government to achieve this, it actually won't address the systemic persistent structural problems that, um, that have created this disparity in the first place. And therefore we need to do something you know, permanent. What this legislation aims to do is to provide sufficient funding to end the digital divide and provide the technical support our students and teachers need. So specifically, the bill provides $180 of additional funding for technology resources on top of the $7,390 already allocated per pupil under our current funding formula. Um, Additionally, it requires that each county board use 7% of their target per pupil foundation amount to provide laptops and other devices, um, internet connectivity, technical assistance, and information technology software to ensure that the additional funding goes towards supplementing, not supplanting, our current IT spending allocations. Finally, this bill requires the county board allocating funds per the subsection follow the IT security standards set by the Department of Information Technology. 
as school systems expand their own IT infrastructure utilizing this funding. This simple bill is a vital step towards making sure our teachers and students have the resources they need to create an equitable and productive learning environment. Um, I just wanted to point out a, a couple of things. Uh, there is in the, um, in, the, in the existing per pupil allotment, currently $350 that is allocated from the General Assembly for information technology. So basically, once you take that $350 plus the additional $180, that becomes 7% of the per pupil allotment. Now, what you'll see in the, the testimony, both for and against, is that there is acknowledgement that local school systems have not been using all of this money for information technology and associated spends. Um, some people are, are excited that this that this seven percent will now have to be you know ring fenced for use in technology and other people uh, other um, opponents are resisting that i just wanted to read um from montgomery county's letter if i could find it so this is from the montgomery county uh, board of education there is currently no required allocation for te technology that lack of clarity has led to systems being unprepared for cyber attacks in virtual learning environments when forced with difficult decisions Many school systems have elected to put limited funds towards other initiatives, leaving it exposed to cyber attacks and poor service in the virtual learning environment. This bill would support this critical work by allocating funds specifically for this purpose and help with these issues. Uh, and so they support it. Other folks use the same rationale to say that they, they do not support the bill. Um, I wanted to point out one other thing, colleagues, and that is that I am working on an amendment to delay the implementation of this bill. Um, we've, I've been tracking what's going on at the federal level, and it appears that there's significant education funding coming in the near future. Um, and so, whereas the bill was originally supposed to kick in in 2022, like other provisions in the Kerwin legislation, we're going to move to delay this uh, to in the future after the federal stimulus has passed. So um, you should look for an amendment from that uh, at our voting session. Um, so anyways, just to sum up, you know, I believe that even beyond COVID, access to technology will have a real impact on our students' ability to access their classes, their complete their assignments, and educational opportunities both in the classroom and at home. And for these reasons, I respectfully request a favorable report, and I'll yield my time to my uh, next witness. Thank, Thank you. you. Senator Hester. Wesley Watts, you are the lead proponent, which means you get up to five minutes. Welcome to EHA. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to just read my testimony. Um, as a former chief information officer of Prince George's County Public Schools for the past 17 years, I've had the pleasure of working with the administration to budget for information technology services for all the students, staff, and the school district in general. During those years, the school district has wired all the schools and offices, installed wireless access points in all the classrooms, cafeterias, gymnasiums, libraries, offices, bus lots, school parking lots, and administrative buildings. Annually, the school district has continued to increase the broadband uh, bandwidth necessary, um, excuse me, uh, necessary and the internet service speeds to accommodate the increase of internet use, the services being provided, and the number of devices and people utilizing the services. The equipment that keeps the network functioning, routers, servers, switches, controllers, and access points are refreshed every seven to 10 years. And that's at a cost of about approximately $50 million, uh, the network. About 14 years ago, Prince George's County invested in computing devices, laptops for its, all of its teaching staff and many of its instructional staff so they have the tools necessary to utilize in the classroom and the student and the school systems online student information system. These devices are typically refreshed every five years. We have 10,000 teachers. Several, several years ago, the Maryland State Department of Education implemented online testing. Prince George's County again planned for the implementation of online testing so that every student could take their test with the administration window, which required that all schools had a certain number of devices available for testing uh, during those specific testing windows. And you had to have approximately 20% uh, of the devices, you had to have 
basically 20% of your students taking the test um, daily. Budget permitting, Prince George's County Public Schools continue to increase the number of student devices annually, but still uh, we're several years away from having devices for every student when COVID shut down schools last March. Anticipating the demand from all school districts, the school system placed an order for 35,000 devices before the end of last school year, and an additional 30,000 devices in July of 2020. Due to the CARES Act and the approval of emergency funds by the Board of Education of the use of one-time funds, the school district was able to provide internet service to thousands of families and provide devices to our students. However, there will be challenges. Without additional funds, many school districts will not be able to fund internet access for students and maintain the computing devices, resulting in going back to the pre-COVID infrastructure. School districts need additional funds to support families that need internet access to maintain the equipment needed to support the district's network and increase the uh, bandwidth and to maintain staff and student devices and provide technical support for the additional of thousands of users. SB 770 provides dedicated funding needed to support each school district's network infrastructure, provide internet service, computing devices, software, and technical support. By providing the additional funding for this, all students should be able to have the tools and services they need in the classroom and at home. That's my testimony. Thank you very much, Mr. Watts, for being with us today. We appreciate you and you're even one minute under. So thank you for that. Uh, Sean Mooney, welcome to Education, Health and Environmental Affairs. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, Sean Mooney from Comcast. Uh, delighted to uh, recommend a favorable report on this legislation. I salute the sponsor, Senator Katie Fry Hester. She's uh, establishing herself as a leader in this area of internet and getting more broadband throughout the state. And uh, it's a pleasure working with her on this initiative. Comcast recognizes the huge need to connect every student in the state of Maryland. This is a step forward in that direction. Um, I urge a favorable report and we look forward to continue to work with the sponsor and others to try to get broadband throughout the state as quickly as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Looney. You're always succinct and positive. We love that. Um, there is one unfavorable, no, there's one unfavorable oral witness and that's John Willems, uh, Maryland Association of Boards of Education, Mr. Willems. And then we'll take questions if there are any. Thank you. Welcome, Mr. Willems. Madam Vice Chair, members of the committee. Um, I think I'm inclined to also be succinct and positive and having submitted a testimony in opposition uh, for many of the reasons that uh, the sponsor, uh, Senator Fry Hester, uh, outlined. Uh, and uh, as I uh, hoped, being a glass half full type of guy, um, her amendments, particularly in deferring and aligning uh, the full implementation of the act with the provision of the what's just over $7 billion in federal funding in the American Rescue Plan for uh, closing the digital divide, which we in the education world refer to as the homework gap uh, uh, many times. We greatly appreciate the uh, sponsor's amendments as she described them and uh, think that we're um, getting to yes on, on this bill and moving forward to address this important issue. Look forward to following up with, with the sponsor on, on those amendments. Thank you. Mr. Willems, we'd love to hear that. Thank you for the getting to yes with Senator Hester. Uh, I see no questions. So that completes the hearing on Senate Bill 770. Thank you all for your testimony. Thank you uh, Senator much. Hester, I am going to change up the order. Senator Benson was here. Hopefully she's still here. Um, Lamoria, is Senator Benson still in the room? So she was supposed to go before. She should order. be on her way back in, Senator Kagan. I just received an email from her assistant. All right. Uh, so colleagues, uh, unfortunately, Senator Benson's bill folder was not in the pile that I got. And so uh, that's why she was not called on. So I'm going to if she will come back quickly. And if not, Senator Hester's other bill has only Senator Hester. So we'll give Senator Benson just a moment. And if not, we will do the other Hester bill. There she is. All right, looking, looking. Senator Benson, are you with us yet? I'm not seeing her yet. She 
she's in there. Okay. All right. So Senator Benson has Senate Bill 840. You make it louder. There we go. Hey, good to see you, Senator Benson. Senate Bill 845, Education, Workforce Development Sequence Scholarships Eligibility. Senator Benson will kick it off. She'll be followed by James Doney uh, and then Peter Constantinou and Ariel Mercado, as well as <laughs> Stephanie Anderson, who was finally going to get to testify. So thank you, Ms. Anderson, for your patience. Uh, Senator Benson, welcome to Education, Health, and Environmental Affairs. You may begin. Well, you just muted yourself. You were unmuted. You just need to unmute one more time. There you go. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, it's always a pleasure to see you. I miss you around the corner, but- I know, I miss you yes, too. It's a little, yeah, we miss you. Thank you, dear. Wonderful people still on this wing. So it's wonderful. So thank you all so very much. Thank you, uh, Madam Vice Chair. Uh, and esteemed members of the uh, Senate Finance Committee. Thank you all for allowing me to speak before you this afternoon. Uh, Senate Bill 845, Education Workforce Development Sequence Scholarships Eligibility Expands Eligibility for the Workforce Development Sequence Scholarship to include a Maryland resident or graduate of a Maryland high school who is enrolled directly in a registered apprenticeship program. Although the definition of workforce development sequence includes registered apprenticeship programs, the current eligibility criteria for the scholarship specifically requires that a recipient be enrolled in a community college in the state. This means that an individual who is enrolled in a registered apprenticeship program, but not a community college, is not currently eligible for the scholarship. This bill expands eligibility for the Workforce Development Sequence Scholarship to include a Maryland resident or graduate of a high school who enrolls in a registered apprenticeship program such as electrician, sheet metal worker, HV, HVAC, HVAC, IT mechanic, etc. licensure, certification, job skill enhancement, and awards them up to uh, $2,000 annually for tuition and fees. This bill with the proposed amendments would ensure that students who want to enroll in a registered apprenticeship program, but who don't have the means to afford it, would be eligible to receive the scholarship to help pay for the first year of a program before they begin on the job training in year two and have an employer who can pay the rest of their way through the program. Let me stop right here. All of our children are not going to college. We have students who just want to go into an apprenticeship program to become an electrician. And you all know that it, these programs right now are in high demand. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to aim at those students who are not going to a community college or a university. And all of us must recognize that these young people have been neglected. They have kind of been pushed to the curb. This provides an opportunity for those students. Now, amendment which makes the legislation more targeted to ensure that the scholarships only apply to registered apprenticeship programs who partner directly with community colleges and to self and to self-funded first-year students who do not receive federal or state financial aid and are not employed in the industry yet. So this provides an opportunity for them to get into the door. This legislation will help self-pay individuals who truly need the support to pay for their first year in a program prior to employment and set them on a path 
to in-demand jobs and family-sustaining wages. You will soon hear from two people who can tell you more about the program and its benefits. James Dooney, first year apprentice in HVAC and HAVCC program. Peter Costanetto, executive director of AACP. Ariel Mercado, current first year apprentice in AAC program. I would ask that you all give this report SB 845, a favorable response. Thank you so much, Senator Benson. Always good to see you. Uh, let's start with uh, James Doney or Dooney. Um, welcome to Education, Health and Environmental Affairs. Thank you, Vice Chair Kagan and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today in support of Senate Bill 845. Uh, to expand eligibility for the Workforce Development Sequence Scholarship. Again, my name is James Downey and I'm currently a student in the Heating and Air Conditioning Contractors of Maryland HACC Apprenticeship Program for HVAC Technicians. I know firsthand what a difference it can mean for people to have an opportunity in a program like this, opening up a new career, pathways, and a new future. This bill would help students who would not otherwise have the resources to afford this opportunity and empower them to get into a widely needed profession like HVACR. I was 45 years old when I started HACC apprenticeship program. And now my final year, I can tr say truly it has opened up my world and, and changed my life. Growing up, I never really had a chance to think about long-term goals where I was heading, I was just trying to get by and earn enough to pay for the bills. Uh, a little background on myself. At 15 years old, I stopped school, started working because my family needed the money for food and bills. Um, I later got my GED and over the years, I worked at an auto body shop, a gas station, cabinetry wood shop, I don't regret any of the jobs that I've had. I have learned from each of them and gained experience and acquired knowledge through each. Uh, but in this program, I do feel like I have a goal and I, I'm specializing myself in a skilled profession in a field that is bursting with opportunity and innovation. Sometimes I think if I only could have known about this a little sooner. Now I see a future for myself in HVAC in the apprenticeship program, we have lectures and hands-on experience with instructors who are dedicated and passionate about what they do. They share from their firsthand experience and really care and help guide you. I also work directly with a master HVAC technician for my on-the-job training. Every day really is like a learning experience. Understanding the complex system mechanics and troubleshooting where something went wrong it's the best feeling to see a customer happy once a unit is repaired and running as it's supposed to. Uh, and they're safe and comfortable again. Not to mention that addressing HVAC and maintaining systems to run efficiently and cleanly as possible is a key part of addressing climate change since HVAC is the single largest energy use in those buildings. I am really grateful for the experience I have had through the HACC apprenticeship program and have new doors open up for me at this point in my life. And I hope we all can do more as a state to help people who are less fortunate get trained and reskilled and for in a demand and good paying career like HVACR. In closing, I urge you to support Senate Bill 845 to ensure that registered apprenticeship programs like HACC are eligible for the Workforce Development Sequence Scholarship so more Marylanders can have the opportunity that I have. Vice Chair Kagan and members of the committee, thank you very much and your patience to hear my testimony. Thank you thank so you. much, Mr. Doney, for sharing your story and the importance of the scholarship for you. We, that helps us. Um, next, we're gonna hear from Peter Constantinou. I hope I got the name close, Constant, Constantinou. You, know, you did, thank you, Vice Chair Kagan. Welcome. Thank you. 
Vice Chair Kagan and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today in support of SB 845. My name is Peter Constantino and I'm ex the Executive Director of the Association of Air Conditioning Professionals, AACP. AACP is a trade association with a membership of over 110 professional HVAC contractor companies. AACP administers a registered apprenticeship program for HVAC technicians. We submitted written testimony, so I will keep this brief. AACP is respectfully urging your support for this bill to help Maryland students and transitioning workers who want to enroll in a registered apprenticeship program but don't have the resources to do so. Now more than ever, there is a critical need to support workforce training and reskilling to help workers who have lost their jobs during the pandemic and get our economy back on track. Our apprenticeship program puts individuals on a career path to high demand, good paying, skilled jobs in the HVAC industry. For reference, AACP member technicians receive an average journey workers rate of $26.62 per hour or over $50,000 per year. Expanding the workforce development sequence scholarship to include registered programs like ours, which partner directly with community colleges, will help more Marylanders have access to these opportunities. Once our apprentices, apprentices get a job required beginning their second year, employers typically cover the cost of tuition. That's why it makes sense to expand eligibility to first year self-funded students as proposed in Senator Benson's amendment, ensuring that existing funds are targeted to those who miss out on apprenticeship opportunities because they don't have a job yet and simply can't afford to get their foot in the door. In closing, I hope you will support this bill to improve access and equity to training opportunities that will prepare Maryland workers for in-demand careers that provide family sustaining wages. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Constantino. Uh, Stephanie, nope, let's go to Ariel Mercado first and then Stephanie, sorry. Ariel Mercado. Can you hear me? Yep, sure can, thank you so much. And I know that logo behind you. I have seen it on many trucks around Rockville and Gaithersburg. All right, <clears throat> thank you so much for the opportunity to testify in support of SB 845 to expand eligibility for the Workforce Development Sequence Scholarship. My name is Ariel Mercado and I'm currently a first year apprentice in the AACP Apprenticeship Program for HVAC Technicians. I'm here today to ask you to vote in favor of this bill to help more young Marylanders and transitioning workers have an opportunity like me to do a registered <clears throat> apprenticeship program and get trained for an in-demand and good paying career like HVAC. So far, the apprenticeship program has given me the chance to gain both on-the-job practical training with James A. Lee and Sons HVAC and Plumbing Services and a theoretical understanding through in-classroom instruction. In the next four to five years, I see myself with a journeyman's license, which I will earn when I graduate from the program <clears throat> and work as a lead tech through install or servicing department, and then eventually earn a master's HVAC license. Expanding the eligibility of this scholarship to include programs like AACP would help bring in new people who don't have the funds to pay their way into the first year and don't have a job yet. I think for a lot of people my age, the idea of paying the full cost and taking on debt scares them and holds them back from enrolling. Especially for self-paying students, this financial support will make a world of difference. It would help them get started and would ultimately support greater diversity and strengthen our skills trades in Maryland. For all these reasons, I hope you'll support this bill. Thank you all for your time. Good job, Mr. Mercado. Thank you for being with us. And now finally, Stephanie Anderson, welcome and thank you for your patience. Thank you, Senator Kagan, um, as well as the committee and Senator Benson, um, our sponsor. I really appreciate the opportunity to um, be able to, to do a capstone on, on this bill. Um, so our bill SB 845 is looking to expand eligibility for the workforce development uh, sequence scholarship that's already in place. Um, I am the executive director of the Heating and Air Conditioning Contractors Association, and we partner with four community colleges in the state um, to provide um, a workforce approved apprentice program. And basically with this bill, it's going to make a small, but it's gonna be make an important change to the publicly funded workforce development sequence scholarship. It's gonna broaden eligibility to allow students who are enrolling in an apprentice program um, at, that is sponsored through the Department of Labor um, and partnering with the community college. Just last year at one of our four locations, 
we um, had seven students that could not in end start the program. And it was all based on funding. Um, of these seven students, one of them was a veteran that was re-entering the workforce that was you know, looking for a change of career. And six of them um, were minority students. So there's really a discrepancy here. And um, having this change on this bill would allow these students to have applied to that funding and perhaps been awarded the funding and start in this wonderful career. Um, so again, really would like a considerable um, you know, a approval of this bill. And I also wanted to take a second and, and thank um, the students, both you know, James and Ariel for speaking um, today on our behalf and all the students we heard today were so impressive and I really love being a part of the process and, and getting to see that. So thank you so much for your time today. Thank you very much, Ms. Anderson. Uh, there are a couple of questions. I had my hand up first, but I am going to defer to Senator Carroza because maybe her question will be the same as mine. Go ahead, Senator. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. And Senator Benson, thank you for introducing this legislation. Um, this has been a passion uh, since my early days as a delegate, focusing on particularly the uh, workforce shortage in the construction industry. So my question is, I know we had a lot of very positive testimony from the heating and air conditioning um, industry. And by the way, we really need you in Ocean City and throughout my district. So I'm really, really need, uh, really glad to hear your testimony and, and for this bill. But I wanted to ask the sponsor if you saw this um, beyond heating and air conditioning apprenticeships, uh, the construction industry in general, even beyond the construction industry, just, just so I uh, better understand the scope of the bill. Well, I would think that anything, let, let, me, let me pull my notes here. Uh, it says that this program, it expands eligibility for workforce development sequence scholarship to include uh, electricians, sheet metal workers, uh, anything that has, if the program is licensed, if it's licensed and certified, if it guarantees a licensure and certified, the program has to be licensed, certified, and it has to pass the requirements that impose that are imposed by the state. Okay, thank it you. Can't be, you know, it can't be just anything. It has to meet certain guidelines. Thank you, Senator Benson, Senator Carosa. Um, Mr. Doney, I wonder if you could answer, just give us 30 seconds on how your education is working during COVID. Are the, I imagine you need to be doing hands-on stuff. So are you coming in? What sort of safety precautions? And again, just super quickly because we still have a bunch more bills. Absolutely. Um, we're essential. Um, so, you know, it's pretty vital. We're just, instead of a team now, it's usually one guy per van. And, you know, if we do have to work with another person, it's, you know, wear a mask and be protective with gloves and wash your hands as much as possible. Okay, great. Distance, you know? But yeah, it's been essential. Good, okay. All right, uh, and are you all eligible for vaccinations earlier than you would be for your age? Um, you know, I've been pretty busy doing okay. <laughs> work and school and, you know, I'm looking forward to it. Um, okay. Ms. Anderson it, says no. Okay, she's shaking her head now. Okay, all right, that's helpful. Uh, seeing no Thank other you. questions, that completes the hearing. Uh, let me just tell you that uh, Don Fry from the Greater Baltimore Committee uh, and Daniel Suskin from the Montgomery County Board of Education both submitted favorable written testimony. So with that, that completes the hearing on Senate Bill 845. Thank you so much, Senator Benson. We'll see you again soon. Thank and you. Thank you, wonderful people. We will go back. Hi, Senator Patterson. <laughs> Hi, Lottie Dottie. <laughs> See you later, alligator. Goodbye, Senator Benson. Take care. We are going to return to Senator Hester, Senate Bill 825, and she is the only oral witness. That uh, bill is Department of Legislative Services Study, Capacity and Accountability of State Department of Education. Senator Madam Hester. Chair. Yes, sir. Could you just give me the lineup from those point on? I've held, I got some folks I've been holding since one o'clock. I'd just like to know what order we're going to go in from this point on. Yep. So this is the last folder that the chair gave to me. So I was about to pass it back to him, assuming he's ready. Here we go. Senator 
Mr. Chairman, do you want to answer Senator Patterson's yeah. question? Senator Patterson, I had Senator Washington, then you, um, except, you know, if Senator Washington wants to defer to you, uh, then you can, yes. answer, Senator Patterson, uh, yeah. I'm happy to defer also. Oh, all right. All right, if you want to do that, Senator yeah, it's Chairman. Fine. Chairman? Thank you, Senator Hester. Why don't we let Senator Patterson go first, passing it back to the chair. Okay, uh, Senator Patterson, then we're moving to Senate Bill 800. And this is a Training and Jobs Act of 2021. Uh, the good Senator from Prince George's County will be followed by Sheila Bryant, uh, Ronald Blakely, uh, and Council Member Calvin uh, Hawkins. Welcome, Councilman. Um, uh, and then uh, Stanley uh, Andrus, and then we have a few favorable with amendments. Yeah. Well, thank you, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and Madam Vice Chair and my colleagues. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to introduce uh, Senate Bill 800. This is a bill that I believe um, will be a life changer for many of our citizens, particularly those who are incarcerated with little or no pathway for sustained rehabilitation. And Lamont, can you go to slide three, please? This is my first time doing this, so I picked it up on all my colleagues on this. So <laughs> hope we can we can can get through it. Um, again, it is my hope that Senator Bill will give our young uh, inmates uh, a, a bit of uh, self dignity, uh, self discipline and just an overall opportunity to get back into the live stream of working and paying taxes and becoming a very productive citizen. And if we could move to slide four. Oh, she ran on it. Uh, as, as most of you know, I was a member of the president uh, of the Senate uh, work group. And uh, we talked about the subject quite a bit. And uh, I, I guess we can, can say that this legislation is in part from that discussion with those uh, six, seven members of, 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 of the work group. Um, it, it, it's just an area that I think uh, Maryland has not taken seriously. Uh, Maryland uh, is a very wealthy, wealthy state. In fact, number one, but we are at the top of the list when it comes to locking up folks uh, throughout the, 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 the state here. So we need to do something about it and we should have been um, on top of this long time ago. So Lamar, can we slip over to, um, I guess we are on that slide five, you got it there. Um, this basically tells the story, if you will, you can take a look at the numbers a little down there a little bit, but as you can see at the bottom of the slide, I is for intake and R is for uh, uh, release. So. Uh, you know, we're looking at in uh, 2019, I believe about um, um, 7,556 and 19 that was uh, taken in and we released about 8,242. So uh, this is a large population that need to um, uh, get serious consideration as to how we can work and reduce those numbers. And slide number six. Slide number six, well, got it. I'll give you a little bit about the age category and how long they are incarcerated. Uh, you got uh, about 40, 64% of those that are locked up for 40 years and below. And of course, uh, uh, those that are serving sentences for zero to 96 months represent about 30% of, of, of that population. Uh, and then we go to slide number seven. So we're gonna get through this much faster than I expected. Um, as most of you know, I served as a parole commissioner and uh, um, that sort of gave me some insight as to um, the, the aspiration, the low aspiration of those who um, had any hope of getting out, many uh, were afraid that once they got out, even where were they going to live, and not to even start thinking about uh, a, a job. Passion of mine, not just recently, but uh, when I was a delegate in 20, uh, 2004, 
I sponsored a similar piece of legislation. I called it uh, legislation for nonviolent drug offenders, uh, treatment and training in lieu of being incarcerated. And for that piece of legislation, I, I was able to leverage about $3 million to help um, move that program. And of course that was under the Ehrlich and Steele administration at that time. And we can go to slide eight. So the big question is, what are we gonna do with a population of 13,075 black and brown, mainly young uh, individuals locked up in our correction center? So let me just offer a few suggestions. Uh, first of all, number one, I think you can make a full commitment to help find the resources necessarily to implement a program for this population. And of course, uh, number two, you can support City Bill 800, which will focus on a coordinated and specific step-by-step -step process of implementation to provide post-secondary education and technical training uh, when inmates are within one year of being uh, discharged from, from um, their, 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 their home stay. Uh, each inmate, of course, will, as you can see, I'm on slide number eight again, uh, will have a individual development plan. We think it's very important to know just where that inmate may need to start with training. Is it uh, prior to getting a GED? Is it a high school diploma? Is it trying to get them out on early release time where they can go to one of the local colleges and take a, a course or two to give them some added skills so that a little bit, they can become a little bit more employable before uh, they get out. And slide number nine just tells you uh, who, who would be major players in this, in this process. Maryland Higher Education Commission, uh, we've been in contact with them, the four HBCUs that are in the state, uh, we've had uh, approval and support letters from each one of those institutions, the Correction Center, uh, uh, Prince George's County, and nonprofits and other business and faith leaders would also be a part of this project. And over on slide um, um, number 10, I think I sort of rolled number 10 into uh, number eight into number 10 a little bit, but uh, we, we have the support of those same organizations, uh, the state NAACP, and of course, the Prince George's County Council. Uh, I think the president of the, uh, uh, the council is gonna be speaking shortly, but uh, just wanted you to know that we've um, made initial contact with what I would consider most of the key players to help us move this project. Um, slide number 11 just basically tells us that uh, the HBCUs will have interns and of course they would have to be at least 18 years of older and of course that work directly under the supervision of uh, this department at one of the HBCUs. And um, I think that's basically a quick snapshot of what I wanted to say, Mr. Chair, Madam Vice Chair, but um, I, I, I know that we have some uh, experts who are going to dive down in the weeds a little bit more and tell you a little bit more about this uh, project. And um, uh, they are uh, Sheila Bryant, who will be first. Then we have Mr. Ron Blakely, uh, who was a former director of the White House Initiative for all HBCUs. Uh, and then of course, we have the chair of the Prince George's County County Council, and I believe we have maybe Kimley Haven uh, is next. And um, I think that would take us to the end of this presentation. So with that in mind, I just hope that um, we uh, get through this pro program such that you're satisfied enough that you can go on record in supporting this, this program. Thank you. Thank you, um, Senator Patterson. Uh, Thank you very much. Then let's start with the lead off witness, uh, Ms. Bryant Allen. Is Ms. Uh, Ms. Bryant, you want to unmute? Okay, there we go. Good afternoon, uh, Senator and uh, 
the committee members. My name is Sheila Bryant, and I'm a member of Progressive Maryland, Prince George's County's Ta Justice Task Force and the Reentry Work Group. I'm a resident of uh, Upper Marlboro, Maryland. I'm speaking today in support of Bill's, uh, Bill, Senate Bill 800. Thank you, Senator uh, Patterson, for bringing it. Um, the Inmate Training and Job Pilot Program, which would provide, as, as the Senator said earlier, vocational training opportunities for an inmate in the nine months preceding his or her release. An inmate. <laughs> and uh, lead to a uh, recognized certificate or license. You know, this is really an opportune time for this bill because the uh, Second Chance Pell Grant Program has been um, expanded and uh, institutions in Maryland, University of Maryland Eastern Shore and Bowie State University have already been invited to participate in it. This, this bill will give people who've made the wrong turn the chance to make it right, to fill the void when our society's uh, safety nets have failed and to offer those who want to be redeemed and rejoin society a second chance, an education and a job. Currently, Maryland has a three-year recidivism rate of about 40%. Recent studies, though, have shown that education is one of the most effective tools for reducing recidivism. Why? Because too many of those people who are released go back to the same circumstances which they faced before getting involved in the system. 60% don't have a high school education or any marketable skills at the time of incarceration. You know, one of our recent working groups, we were asked to give a headline to describe what we hope to achieve in our reentry work. Mine was this, Maryland has the model to show the world how to welcome home our citizens. Those who were written off behind bars, we welcome them with a, a soft place to land, opportunities to grow and hope for a productive future. It's my dream and it should be yours that uh, the way to improve this, the well being of our communities is to restore respect and admiration to the son who's seen his dad only behind bars, to let that mother who's been separated from her kids earn a living to take care of them, a job, a future, an education. We have to remember that 95% of the people incarcerated right now will eventually rejoin society, developing the tools and programs now that can reduce recidivism and restore self-respect and dignity will create long-term results that help everyone live happier, safer lives. As a progressive society, we have a vested interest in helping to prevent recidivism and keep our community safe while also allowing a meaningful expectation that returning citizens can survive, thrive, and prosper. This bill is a step in that direction. It's not a big ticket item, but the investment will be well worth it. Please support this bill. Thank you for your time. Thank you, uh, Ms. Bryant. Um, let's go to Mr. Blakely and then the council member. Uh, you're muted, Mr. Blakely. Back. Okay, can you hear me now? Perfectly. Okay, great. Uh, first of all, let me say uh, good afternoon and thank you for providing an opportunity for me to speak on behalf of the Prince George's County Drug Policy Coalition. I am Ronald Blakely, and I currently serve as the vice, vice president of the Drug Policy Coalition. As was mentioned earlier, I spent a number of years in the federal sector uh, working on the Department of Education and the White House Initiative on HBCUs, working with all of the HBCUs within the state of Maryland and across the nation. It was um, a very interesting and important job where we saw a number of the HBCUs to deal with community-based organizations activities. One of the things I've learned over the years is to always place first things first. And so let me say after reviewing the bill and talking with um, people in the coalition that it is the position of Prince George's County Drug Policy Coalition that we wholeheartedly support the Senate Bill 800, the Inmate Training and Job Act of 2021. Our coalition is part of a national uh, alliance 
that deals with drug policy issues across the country, uh, a recognized 501c3. As we recognize that drugs have devastated numerous families and communities in Prince George's County and across the state of Maryland, we believe that this bill provides a pathway to rebuild the family structure and reestablish community connections destroyed by drugs in prison. The Drug Policy Coalition is totally committed to developing policies and programs that will directly support all community-based activities to improve the quality of life for the citizens in Prince George's County and the state of Maryland. I must say that I was particularly happy to see that this uh, act uh, considers what I always call a whole person approach to reconnecting inmates uh, with their communities and families instead of focusing on one single issue or resulting in that old revolving door syndrome where they return to prison in a couple of years. We believe this act creates a comprehensive approach to reconnecting inmates with society where they will become highly productive citizens. This act incorporates some key components that we believe will be necessary. We recognize the education, training, Mr. Mr. Blakely, placement. Yes. You've got to wrap up, sir. Okay, uh, workplace will uh, be successful in the program. So let me Great. say in closing that it is our position that we fully support this. We thank you for including the HBCUs and we will continue to work with um, organizations who are working to end the cycle. Thank you. Uh, prison thank jail. you, sir. Thank you. Okay, uh, let's go to uh, Prince George's Council President Calvin Hawkins. Welcome, Council Member. Good Thank to see you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Chair Pensky and Council uh, Senator Patterson for this opportunity and to the members of the Education, Health, and Environment. Ka Calvin, can you up the volume a little bit or move closer to the mic? Is this better? A little bit. Okay, I'll, I'll raise my voice then. Again, thank you for this opportunity for allowing me the time to speak on uh, SB 800, the Inmate Training and Jobs Act. And again, my name is Calvin Hawkins. I'm the chair of the Prince George's County Council. I would love to tell you about what we are doing in Prince George's County, but I'm an ad lib. I am a returning citizen that at age 22, I spent seven years of my life in prison. I came out in at the age of 29, and if it were not for a program like SB 800 that allowed me to develop a skill and go to an institution of higher learning, I could not say to any of you that I would be in front of you as a productive citizen who has been out of prison for over 35 years. I ask each of you, as you think about SB 800, there are young people and older people coming out that just need a chance. They just need to know that their time in prison was not just a time for punishment, but an opportunity for rehabilitation. Those of us who were involved in the college program in the prison that I was in, we had the lowest recidivism rate of any program in that prison. I ask each of you, take the time to give some individuals a, a second chance at life. And Senator Patterson, I'm so grateful for this opportunity and I hope that you all will support SB 800 because there's individuals out there like me that could benefit from this opportunity. Thank you, Senator Pisky, and thank all of you for listening. Thank you, uh, Council Member, uh, Council President. Uh, a very compelling story, life story. And sometimes you should sit down with uh, uh, Calvin Hawkins. Um, let's go to uh, Stanley Andrus, and then we'll go to Kimberly Haven, who has an amendment. Mr. Andrus. Good afternoon, committee members, and thank you, Senator Patterson, and, and thank you to you all for uh, allowing me to speak to you this, this afternoon. Um, I spoke to uh, some of you um, previously uh, on, a, on a similar bill, um, but I, I come here too as a formerly incarcerated individual who with multiple felony convictions was sentenced to 10 years in prison as a prior and persistent career criminal 
um, in my early 20s. Um, I was told by a prosecutor who was looking to send me away for 20 years to life that I had no hope for changing the decisions that I had been making up until that time in my early 20s. Uh, I'm originally from Ferguson, Missouri. Um, I've been here in Baltimore for about seven years. Um, fast forward some time after my, uh, you know, being incarcerated, I am now Dr. Stanley Andres, an endocrinologist and professor uh, at Howard University College of Medicine, formerly uh, at Johns Hopkins Medicine and, and also an affiliate professor at Georgetown Medicine. Um, I've clearly changed from what this prosecutor was prophesizing those many years ago and education was that game changing event for me. Um, I'm also the executive director and co-founder of From Prison Cells to PhD. We run a program called Prison to Professionals here in Maryland where we work with, uh, we have over 400 applications from currently and formerly incarcerated men and women throughout the state. We have about 100 people that complete our program. We have about a 97% uh, success rate of getting people into post-secondary education and employment. We are very skilled at what we do and we utilize this asset-based approach where uh, 20, you know, 85% of the 26 paid employees are all formerly incarcerated individuals. Uh, over 50% of the 200 plus volunteers are formerly incarcerated individuals. We know how to do this work. Um, and I'm here today in support of Senate Bill 800. I've worked with Senator Patterson on a similar bill that's looking to remove the criminal conviction questions from college applications. Our organization works very hard to increase access to education and employment for currently and formerly incarcerated people. I have a few questions before I end um, to kind of highlight some of the things that I know that we can bring to this bill. As very briefly, it, Dr. Andrus, we're briefly, almost out of time. Briefly. So I just want to mention, you know, who has experience helping currently incarcerated people complete FAFSAs my organization has that. Who has experienced training formerly incarcerated people to be student mentors as this bill is proposing to have, which we would, uh, we're asking for an amendment that those student mentors be formerly incarcerated. My organization has the ability to train those individuals. Who has connections to a national network of formerly incarcerated college graduates? Our organization has that. Uh, we have experience implementing mm -hmm. college programming in a culturally sensitive manner that is trauma informed. And we truly believe that formerly incarcerated people need to be the leaders in these types of efforts. Uh, so I, I encourage you to support this bill and thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Um, we're gonna go to Ms. Haven, you are favorable with amendments. Can you focus on the amendments if you would? We've learned about the bill. Yes, uh, my name is Kimberly Haven. I'm the director of uh, policy and advocacy for from prison cells to PhD. And the amendment that we would be offering is to increase the time of the program from nine months to 12 months. Uh, we know that that extended time also lends itself to um, higher educational attainment and achievement. And that includes vocational and job training. The um, other amendment that we would be offering is the inclusion of a program such as from Food Cells to PhD for the reasons that my colleague, Dr. Andresi um, outlined, which are the best people for mentoring in this program and for advising are those of us that have charted the path. I too am formerly incarcerated. And so we know how it works. We know how to relate and we could provide the service. So those are the two amendments that um, from prison cells to PhD would be offering. This bill really is about education and attainment. It is really about education as the great equalizer. It is about not just people you know, coming back into the community, it is about creating a new workforce, creating a new economic base. And so for those reasons, and again, I will be very brief um, because you wanted me to focus just on the amendments. Those are the two amendments that we would be putting forth and we urge this committee's favorable report of SB 800. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ms. Haven. I appreciate the consideration. Um, that concludes the hearing. I don't see any hands. So uh, thank you all for your uh, participation. Uh, your patience um, and your engagement. Oh, I'm sorry, Senator Fry Hester has a question. I'm sorry, I just thought you said the hearing, they were closing the hearing. I just didn't want you to forget about my bill. No, 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 no the hearing on this bill. Okay, uh, then we have completed the hearing on this bill. Um, we have uh, uh, four more to go. Thank you. Um, 
uh, people. Um, okay, we're gonna go to Senator Hester. Oh, she popped back up. Okay, we're gonna go to uh, Senate Bill 825, uh, Legislative Services, Capacity and Accountability of State Department of Education. Uh, Thank, you, Ms. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'm popping up and down because I got a new standing desk and I really like it. Um, so members of the committee, thank you for your consideration of Senate Bill 825. For the record, Senator Katie Fry Hester. Um, and I don't have any witnesses on this bill because I believe each and every one of you has experienced a portion of what I'm gonna talk about today. So in effect, you are my witnesses. Um, the past year, we've seen many challenges with the school closing. And I just wanna thank all of the local school systems out there. I think they've done a phenomenal job stepping up to educate our children under this challenging condition. Um, on the other hand, I've asked uh, the Maryland State Department of Education several times for how they were helping our locals. What were their plans to do X, Y, and Z? And it's been difficult to get information from them. I think we're still waiting for the status of devices, hotspots, and connectivity you know, across the state or, or whether the State Department was helping to procure PPE at the state level. In October, I wrote a letter to MSDE urging them to consider uh, many different ways to help the locals. Um, and this was published in Maryland Matters on October 19th. And I had 15 different suggestions. I won't go through them all, but just to hit the top five. I really encourage them to use the state's purchasing power to achieve economies of scale, to secure re a reliable supply of PPE. I urge them to create an online dashboard to track COVID-19 cases in the K through 12, which they eventually did, although it, there's always room for improvement. Um, I asked them to focus on improving school cybersecurity, given that all our children were working online. Um, there was a suggestion to partner at the state level to help close the digital divide by working with broadband providers. And there was also a suggestion to, to, to think forward, to think about a learning loss program and what would be required this, this summer. So that's five out of the 15 that were in that article. But this bill is not just about the pandemic. While the pandemic has exposed these gaps, um, the need for a management capacity audit is not new. I've learned that before my time here, there was um, legislation that required a work group to study the management capacity and organizational structure of the department. Apparently this group started to meet and the state superintendent was assigned to chair this work group. After that, the work group rarely met and few of any recommendations were made. So that work has not yet been completed and it's now past time for an outside look at the accountability, capacity, and management structure of the department. We need to know that the department has the capacity and tools they need to implement the blueprint for Maryland's future. Therefore, the bill in front of you does three things. First of all, it requires DLS to contract the consultant to work with the department on an audit to make sure that they have the staff, the resource, and the tools necessary to carry out the responsibility they have in the blueprint. Um, secondly, this consultant would help them to collect data and account for how the local departments and the State Department have spent the COVID-19 relief funding from the federal government. And third, there would, be, there would be support given to help track the learning loss through MLDS, the Maryland Longitudinal Data Center, and also the, the plans for the mitigation of that learning loss. So as you know, the department is in the midst of a transition. They are slated to bring on a, a board a new state superintendent later this year. I am sure that the new superintendent will do all their best to address the long-standing concerns about the department. But if we can equip this individual with an objective evaluation of the department, it will go a long way in supporting them on the, their difficult endeavor going forward. And for this reason, I respectfully request a favorable report on 825, and I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, questions for the good senator from Carroll Howard County. Uh, seeing none, uh, the bill hearing for this bill only uh, is over. We have uh, a few more to go. We have Senator Washington and myself and Senator Lamb, the left three of the day. Um, so thank you, uh, Senator Fry Hester. Let's go to Senator Washington. Um, she will present 767 Hunger Free Campus Grant Program. She'll be followed by Julia Gross, uh, Gabrielle Wilson, uh, Jeanier uh, Pineris, and Odessa Davis. Um, I'm looking at the sign up. I see no opposition, uh, either oral or written. So um, let's try not to be repetitive, but additive to the witnesses. 
Uh, and with that, Senator Washington, you have thank the floor. You. Thank you. Um, I, I was just getting ready to, to thank Senator Hester for that bill, because I, I know a lot of us have experienced frustration with that. Uh, as well. So I look forward to, to talking about it later. Um, for the record, I'm Senator Mary Washington, uh, 43rd District, and I'm here to ask for your favorable support of SB 767. It's actually a what I believe is a request for a modest investment in what is a large and growing problem but enabling us to make a first step. And this, this bill, uh, as well as my, even though I'm the the chair of the Joint Committee on Ending Homelessness. Uh, as over time I've learned more about youth homelessness, I've begun to, and our committee has begun to look at the intersection of home, people experiencing homelessness as well as hunger. Uh, back in November of last year, so about eight months into the pandemic, I was asked by a constituent, uh, Cicely Steffens, who is president of the Eat Right Club at Morgan State University. She's a, a student. And she asked me to participate in a hunger and homeless awareness week activity that she was uh, organizing. And she and actually uh, was a part of an or organization or a group of 700 um, colleges and universities across the, the country who were, or different organizations who were participating uh, to build awareness. Um, her Eat Right Club actually started just as a way of educating students on campus about healthy nutrition, right? And, and her, their thought was that they would help uh, feed other people in the community and help people in the community um, um, eat better. But what she found through her work was that they began to find that not only were the people in the surrounding communities, that they were their, her own colleagues, her own students, uh, fellow students on the campuses were also experiencing hunger. Uh, and her, her group started to look more at drawing public attention to the problem of poverty. And they began to really build up a base of volunteers and supporters to look at anti-poverty work. Um, she, she also learned, and I learned as well, that um, sometimes members of our, our faculty and administration and staff um, are, are still operating under a sense of of who they think our college students are. We still in some ways think of them as sort of temporarily poor uh, or, or voluntarily poor as they work through, through college and not really recognizing the changing dynamics and not recognizing that there is existence of hunger crisis right on our campuses and that that affects student performance. Um, we know through COVID-19 that K through 12 students are at higher risk of hunger and homelessness, but so are college students due to stretched finances and limiting schedules uh, for part-time work. So what does Hunger-Free Campus do? It sends, it provides just a, an initial small, I think, investment, um, but what I hope will build uh, momentum towards addressing a student hunger on campus. And it has sort of three main component, components. One, it's to what they call swipe out hunger uh, program on campus. And I hear there's some, there's some feedback and criticism and, and, and some corrections to this part of the bill, but I believe conceptually it works. And so we just need to work it out. But the, the idea is that there are meal plans um, colleges could implement a swipe out hunger program that can enable students to donate their extra meals to peers who are facing food insecurity on campus. Um, when we think about, we have these in state government, we have uh, these um, banks where you can put your sick days or your uh, unused earn leave, you can create these leave banks. Uh, the concept in here is to create sort of a food bank that's virtual that can be used um, you know, with the swipe of a card. Second, it establishes uh, a food pantry on our college campuses. Many campuses are, are doing it. Um, I really appreciate the, um, the letter from the, um, our independent colleges and universities, our private schools that a lot of them are doing that. Um, and, and, and thank you so much for doing that work. I know that some of our, our campuses, our public campuses are doing it, but we really need to establish these food uh, pantries on campus to reduce the stigma and provide an opportunity for students who are uh, food insecure to get access to food. And then third, finally, is to really expand and look at SNAP enrollment opportunities. Um, campuses can designate a person to ensure students have access to accurate information about supplemental, uh, about the supplemental nutrition 
uh, assistance program. I know the, the vice chair doesn't like uh, acronyms, so SNAP. Um, one in three college students faces food insecurity. We know this. Uh, about a third of college students have missed a meal at least once during, during the pandemic. More than half of college students sometimes uh, use off-campus food banks. Uh, there are students who are reporting that, you know, they're drinking water. You saw from some of the materials about some of the coping uh, mechanisms that students are doing in order um, because there's still this stigma associated with it. The expectation is that, well, you're in college, you have money for college, why don't you have money for food? And we really, really need to address that. So. Um, as a grant recipient, we'd establish a hunger-free task force. Uh, we would designate support staff to support you. Um, we can raise awareness about insecurity and, as I said, to reduce the stigma. Uh, uh, colleagues, I believe that, again, legislation like this um, can really go a long way. We can really continue to be a leader. Uh, we're a leader in education. Uh, we must also be uh, make this critical, critical investment in ensuring that our students aren't forced to suffer hunger or negative outcomes as they pursue higher education in the great state of Maryland. Thank you, colleagues, Thank you. and I look forward to your favorable report. Thank I'm you, committee. Uh, before I go to the witnesses, let me make an announcement. I see 10 of the 11 of the committee here. Um, you'll be receiving one voting list for tomorrow in the next half hour or so. There may be a second one later this evening. Uh, I would also ask you, besides leaving open tomorrow after hearings, uh, that we may also be holding hearings Thursday after hearings, and it also warn you to be somewhat flexible Friday morning. We may look for uh, an, an AM voting session as well. So just it's getting to be that time. So uh, I just wanted to give you some heads up on all of those. Okay, uh, back to the bill. Announcement over. Uh, Julia Gross. Uh, Gabrielle Wilson, Jeanne Pinieras, and Odessa Davis. Ms. Gross. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Vice Chair Kagan, and members of the committee for the opportunity to speak. My name is Julia Gross. I am the Anti Hunger Program Associate with Maryland Hunger Solutions. We're a statewide nonprofit, uh, nonpartisan organization working to end hunger and improve the nutrition, health, and well being of individuals, families, and children across the state of Maryland. In our work as SNAP Outreach Partners, we've had the opportunity to work with a number of different colleges and universities across the state. And we know from this work that hunger in higher education is a pervasive issue. Um, and it's not new. In even pre-COVID times, food insecurity rates among college students were higher than the national average for adults. And we've submitted written testimony already, so I'm not gonna read you the numbers. Um, but I do wanna talk about some of the additional barriers that college students face when it comes to accessing food. Many students are balancing classes, jobs, internships, as well as caring for families of their own. And I wanna be really clear that when I say college students, I'm not just talking about 18 year olds coming straight from high school with the support of their families and parents, uh, which I think is a lot of times what we think of when we say college students. But I'm also talking about veterans coming into school after they're serving. Um, I'm talking about students coming from foster care, first generation students striving to break free from generational poverty, I'm talking about students with disabilities and those suffering from um, invisible mental health issues that might prevent them from working. Um, you also wanna make sure that we include those struggling with homelessness um, and parents who are spending their days with their children, helping them through school while they take night classes. And I certainly don't want to forget about the low income campus staff um, who are working to make these make sure these students have safe and fulfilling college experiences. Um, we know that the student body in Maryland is diverse um, and the communities on these campuses are uh, also diverse working towards educational and career goals. Um, so when I'm finished, I know you'll be hearing from uh, college students and pantry coordinators who both have really critical insight into the challenges and struggles that students face. Um, unfortunately, we won't get to hear from all of our partners, um, like Anne Arundel County Community College, who's been delivering uh, food boxes to their students and faculty during COVID, um, or the University of Maryland, which already has a hunger-free task force um, studying and addressing food insecurity on their campus. Um, but I know a number of them have submitted written testimony as well. Um, and so, you'll get to hear some of those examples of how their critical work uh, is, um, you know, 
helping students address this challenge. Um, so many of the students that we've uh, helped with SNAP application assistance on uh, campuses actually do work and meet the work requirements, um, the 20 hours a week work requirement for SNAP eligibility, but they're unfortunately unaware of their eligibility because these regulations are complicated and difficult to navigate. The Hunger Free Campus Grant Program is going to help address and remove some of those barriers. And while this bill isn't going to solve the issue of hunger completely, having these state funds available will allow campuses with limited capacity to start programs where they may not have been able to before. And it's going to allow existing programs to expand and meet the needs of their communities as they grow. We know that hungry students that we've been sharing over and over again when we talk about expanding access to the national school lunch program and school breakfast program. And even though college students don't have access to free and reduced price meals, um, they're certainly no exception and hungry college students can't learn as well, which is why we see this bill as a really critical investment in Maryland's higher education system as well as our future. So we believe that no one should be deterred from achieving their educational dreams because of hunger, and no student should be forced to suffer disproportionately from food insecurity because of their pursuit of higher education. Um, so with that, I respectfully urge a favorable support of uh, Senate Bill 767 and yield my time. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, uh, Ms. Gross. Um, Ms. Wilson, Gabrielle Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Chair members of the committee. My name is Gabrielle Wilson. I am the pantry, camp, campus pantry organizer at University of Baltimore as well as a graduate student. Um, and I'm here to talk to you today less about the facts and more about what I've seen over the last year, especially. Um, both Senator Washington and Julia did a great job of kind of laying out the scene of what campus hunger looks like. And as I've been watching over the past 12 months, I've seen those cracks in the system deepen and I've watched more and more students fall into them and never get their way out. Um, and it seems to me that higher ed's become a really big one-way transactional process where we're asking students to give all of themselves, including all of their money and their future earnings. Um, and when they can't, when they struggle with the basics and trying to get through each day, a lot of the times they don't find the support that they need. Um, and that just hurts both as a student and somebody who works at a university and that's not what it should look like. The effects of COVID and how they, what they've had in our students in the economy are going to last long after all back on campus and we're to our new normal. Um, and they're going to deeply need help. Uh, this bill is a really good opportunity for everyone, including the state at the highest level to really show that you, you, know, you care about the students, you care about them as entire people and their well-being and their health and their happiness as they work their way through their degree and as they go on to graduate and become successful members of their of our society. Um, and therefore, I'm urging a favorable reporting of uh, SB 767 in order to give our students, you know, everything that they need to become what they need to be. Thank you, Ms. Wilson. Uh, Ms. Uh, Pinares. Thank you, Chair, Vice Chairs, and members of the committee. And thank you, Senator Washington, for sponsoring this bill. My name is Janera Pinares. I am a current student at Montgomery College, and I am here today to support this bill because as a teen mom and current student, I don't want my son to stop pursuing his dreams because of hunger. When I enrolled in Montgomery College back in 2019, I was excited to start my medical career, but a couple months later, my family's economic situation was not the best. We were owning about four months Ran, so I had to write letters of support to these three churches, and we also had an eviction order, so I had to drop off college. This is about empowering our youngest population to accomplish their goals, get a higher education, and be able to provide a better future for their families. If this would have been in place back then, I will probably be getting my associate degree as a student in a couple of months. If we approve this deal, it will be inspiring our children to follow their dreams. Thank you so much for your consideration. I support this initiative and look forward to a favorable report. Thank you. Thank you, um, Ms. Pinares. Nice job. Um, let's go to Odessa Davis, Man of Food. Good afternoon, Chair Pinsky, Vice Chair Kagan, and members of the committee. I am Odessa Davis, appearing today in support of SB 767 on behalf of Man of Food Center and Critical Issue Reform. 
Manna is Montgomery County's Maryland designated food bank with, with a singular mission of eliminating hunger in our county. The critical issue form advocacy for social justice is a coalition of three synagogues in Montgomery County and is involved in food insecurity issues. Maryland has established several programs to address food insecurity for students from elementary to high school, but it's less well known for school food insecurity, significant and growing issue on many college campuses. I am testifying today because I'm a recent graduate of Montgomery College, proudly with honors and a mother of a son in Montgomery County Public School. I have experienced personally the struggles involved with food insecurity while being a college student. I know that hunger challenge ch challenges students of any age learn and concentrate. What challenges did I do during the journey? My son and I were financially limited despite holding down four jobs at one point, including working in MCPS. While my salary was small, I was over the benefit level for SNAP, but I did get help from Montgomery County. My son received free breakfast and reduced lunch. Since re my resource was limited, I relied on Montgomery College programs as their pantry, their monthly food distribution and clothes. When I would stay late on campus, I would get free snacks from the writing center, library, and tutoring center. Over the four years of going to Montgomery College, I met a lot of single parents that was in the same situation as me that I started a club called, at Montgomery College called Back on Track. This group helps us come together and get through the food insecurity, finance, and academic challenges. Three out of five active members graduated May 2020. The issues of food insecurity that I experienced and witnessed among my peers is only growing as the cost escalated. The Hunger Free Campus Grant Program established by SB 767 recognized this vital need. MANA and CIF strongly support SB 767 as it will improve the abilities of college students at both two-year and four-year public school to graduate and become productive citizens of Maryland. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Davis. Uh, question for any of the panelists. Uh, again, there's no one signed up in opposition. Seeing no hands, that completes the hearing on 767. Thank you, Senator Washington. Thank you. Uh, interesting bill. Um, we're gonna get next to last, uh, Senator Lamb, and then I guess the last bill of the day is Senator Rapinski, the chairman. Okay. Uh, uh, it looks like we have a PowerPoint. If it's Dr. Lamb, it must mean we have a PowerPoint. Um, uh, Senator Lamb will um, present the bill. He'll be followed by Sharon Manecki from the National Federation of the Blind, uh, Derek Day, and then Garrett Mooney. And then they will be followed by Jonathan Lazar with an amendment. And then we'll take questions. Then we'll go to unfavorable Mr. Wollums. Okay, Senator, you're on. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee. For the record, Clarence, I am Senator District 12. This is SB 921. Um, and uh, this bill came to us um, to try to address a problem for uh, members of the disability community to be able to get a proper education. And so, unfortunately, with the shift from in-person to predominantly virtual education over the past year necessitated by the pandemic, this has accentuated some serious um, shortcomings in our current educational system. This is particularly true pertaining to the provision of appropriate accessibility for students and parents with disabilities. As a result the, of the improvised and, and kind of emergency nature of online learning, there's been increased use of inaccessible instructional technologies in our school. Our blind students in grades K through 12 are increasingly um, unable to access their educational content as a result of these changes. This has happened despite the clear requirements in state and federal law that mandate accessibility of information and communication technology, digital content and services such as educational applications and websites. This lack of appropriate accessibility also means that parents with disabilities cannot access information curriculum or programs adequately or at all, and therefore cannot help their children who may or may not have their own disabilities. This has serious negative impacts on the learning development opportunities and success of these students. Many students have been unable to participate in specific classes or activities because the technologies purchased by their jurisdictions do not interface with non-visual um, 
accessibility platforms. One reason for this um, shortcoming is that the local school systems and the State Department of Education have not enforced the requirement for developers to ensure accessibility before purchasing and implementing technologies. Uh, another reason is that they have not prohibited staff members from using inaccessible materials that they find on their own. This has resulted in blind students, for example, being unable to participate in group activities with their peers during a virtual class, uh, which clearly um, has negative social and emotional impacts on these students in addition to their academic implications. Um, and so basically as things are now, local school systems and MSDE have no real accountability for accessibility to these students with disabilities. So next slide, Memoria. Um, the bill puts disability accountability measures in place during the local procurement process for digital technologies and content. It does this through several methods. One, it requires vendors to accessibility conformance report demonstrating how their technology complies with accessibility standards. Two, the bill requires a representative who specializes in providing vision services to be part of the evaluation team for bids. Three, counties must purchase only accessible digital tools, such as those that are defined by federal law. Um, four, the bill puts fines into place for vendors who misrepresent or do not repair inaccessible platforms. And lastly, it requires jurisdictions to provide accessibility information on their websites for public transparency. Next slide. This legislation creates um, necessary accountability, which we believe is missing at this point, and that would enable um, those who require non-visual access information communication technology to obtain that access more easily. Vendors would also be more accountable because they would be asked to submit a voluntary product accessibility template as part of their proposals and uh, find if they fall short of these accessibility standards. The bill would also require that students with disabilities have access to educational content and tools that they're entitled to by law. And uh, what's more, incorporating accessibility into technology is actually not that difficult and is much more cost effective to incorporate at the initial planning stage than to do so retroactively after the fact. Next slide. There are numerous written testimonies submitted from just a small sampling of parents and students with disabilities describing their differences and experiences as a result of the lack of accessibility and accountability in the current system. And they are all accessible to you on your floor system uh, for you to view. Given our limitations on oral testimony, you will hear a testimony today from just a few of those individuals who are um, uh, providing their experiences, but there are many more who um, have also submitted testimony to of their concerns. Just quickly highlight a few examples of difficulties that they're experiencing. When, um, for example, schools move to virtual learning, school districts inform parents of blind children that adaptive technology used by the blind, such as screen readers and braille displays had been deployed and were available to students. Although these tools can help students read screens, they only work when the computer programs are actually read accessible on their own. In Howard County, for example, blind students are unable to participate in high school math classes because the program that they use, Geo, uh, GeoDropa, is not accessible to them. Other students have trouble participating in classes on a program called Kahoot, which requires an understanding of color. Um, a mom in Frederick, who herself is blind, cannot uh, get curriculum to load onto her screen reader and thus unable to help their children during um, their work during virtual school. Some districts have also issued Chromebooks, which are not accessible with screen readers. So as I conclude my testimony, you'll hear from several witnesses who will provide additional details about these and other problems that they're having um, because of the lack of accessibility and accountability. Um, there is, uh, next slide, um, there is a sponsor amendment, which is attached to um, my written testimony as well. Um, and it should be available to your floor to you on your floor laptop system too. The amendment makes corrections and improves the bill language in two ways. First, it requires a vendor to include an indemnification clause in the contract, which will increase the vendor's commitment to accessibility. Um, our, our belief is that taxpayers should not have to pay for inaccessible products or mistakes that vendors may make. Number two, it changes that, it changes um, the designated accessibility evaluators in this process from a person in the Division of Rehabilitation Services to the blindness specialist in the Division of Early Intervention and Special Education Services, which is part of the Maryland State Department of Education. The Division of Early Intervention and um, 
and Special Education Services works with K through 12 students, while the Division of Rehabilitation Services primarily works with adults to prepare them for the world of work. So this is um, a better representative for this task. Uh, so appreciate your attention to this request. Encourage you to uh, consider a favorable report for this bill. Um, happy to take any questions. Um, I may have to jump off in a few minutes for another meeting, but um, uh, happy to connect with the colleagues on the committee uh, afterwards as well. Thank you. Uh, let's go to uh, uh, Ms. Minecki. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ms. Vice Chairman and members of the committee. First of all, I wanna thank Senator Lamb for introducing this bill. I wanna start out by telling you what the bill is not. It has nothing to do with the IEP process and it is not new policy. This is an implementation bill. The goal is to stop local school systems from buying inaccessible platforms and digital content and ICT. So when you think about accessibility, think about the structure, okay? We're all familiar with ramps to help people get into the building. We're all familiar with um, making the doors light so you can push them open. So we don't wait for somebody to come along to do these things. We get the structure right. And that's what we're asking in this bill. So in other words, the platforms and the uh, ICT and the digital comment, they're the doors and the access. They're the structure to get these uh, programs usable. So this is really a common sense bill. The, uh, it's, it says that the procurement folks will talk to the vision folks who have, a, who have knowledge of whether something is accessibility or not. The other thing uh, which Senator, Mann, uh, Senator uh, Lamb mentioned was about doors. Um, that amendment is a good amendment. I would also say that um, in my opinion, the state expenditures on the fiscal note would go away because the blindness specialist position already exists. Also, um, reporting if the if the Department of uh, Education has to put the report from the local school system on their website, um, they're going to pay more attention to it. And that's what we're looking for. We're looking for somebody in the local and in the MSDE to pay attention to this problem because it's been on, it's been the law for decades, but nobody's doing it. Also, um, I just want to say that um, the penalty um, that is mentioned for the vendors in the local school system, there's precedent for that. In 2018, uh, this body of Maryland General Assembly passed a law. So there is a penalty for the rest of the executive branch if uh, their vendors um, don't comply with the accessibility. So it's time to bring this down to the local school system uh, so that the students can have access to the curriculum. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you, uh, Ms. Minecki. Uh, let's go to uh, Garrett Mooney, please. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair in the committee. My name is Garrett Mooney, and I am the president of the Maryland Organization of Parents of Blind Children. Public education has made a promise to our children to, to provide a free and appropriate education. This bill is necessary because it is time that we start holding vendors and school districts accountable and ensure that this promise and commitment is maintained. In August of 2020, the Maryland Organization of Parents of Blind Children, the division of the National Federation of Blind of Maryland, sent a letter to all 24 districts across the state, including State Superintendent Karen B. Salmon, asking those local systems how they would be providing services unique to blind students, specifically braille instruction, orientation and mobility, in addition to how they would be providing materials that are, that are accessible for blind and low vision students. Many of the districts attempted to answer these questions. Some did, 
and some did not. And as Senator Lamb indicated during his presentation, offered information such as the availability of screen readers and braille displays would make the programs accessible. And as Senator Lamb uh, stated in his presentation as well, this does not, these, these type of materials only work if the materials themselves are accessible. I'd like to share two stories for you very quickly uh, to the members of the committee. The first is of Kelly and Tyler. These, these two members of, of our organization had been fighting their districts bef years before COVID to get access to get an, a Windows computer because the Chromebooks distributed were, were not accessible with a screen reader. Well, when COVID happened, instead of continuing to fight the district and fall behind in a virtual classroom, Tyler gathered up his own birthday money and Christmas money and purchased his own Windows laptop because the district would not provide one to him. Members of the committee, this is not a free and appropriate education. This right here was a failed promise and a failed commitment by the district. In my own school district of Baltimore City, my kindergarten daughter is unable to, to use the learning platform to reinforce lessons that she has learned from the teacher in an already shortened school day. Consequently, we, me and my fiance have to come up with unique ways to reinforce lessons for her. As blind parents ourselves, we are also un, we're unable to administer the assessments asked by her general education kindergarten teacher. And this is because those learning platforms were inaccessible. We had to acquire a reader to help administer the assessments to our daughter. Mr. Once Mooney, again, you have to wrap up. up. Thank you. Uh, I, all I was going to say to the rest of the committee is that we have access to more technology than ever before. It's time that we start fulfilling those promises and commitments to the children and give them access to that technology. Thank you, sir. Uh, we're going to go to Derek Day and then finally Jonathan Lazar. And then Mr. Hello, my name is Derek Day. Sorry, I was having some troubles with Zoom. Um, I'm a student in Carroll County Public Schools, um, which is obviously one of the districts that I think we are one of the first ones. I don't know. We're in hybrid right now. But before that, um, and even now, there's platforms that I still can't access. The GeoGebra thing that they were talking about, um, we just recently, that's not even on my uh, testimony because we haven't, that, that just started, but that one I can't use. Um, and there's many platforms used by the school system that I cannot access. One of my classes, the field, my, my career field that I'm trying to go into is computer science. And that specific class in my high school uses code.org, which is a program that's not accessible. So this lack of accessibility is stopping me from taking classes. And in that case, that allow me to get certifications I'll need for my job. So this bill is extremely important that it gets passed, especially now, but it will, it will help us for years in the future too, even after the pandemic, because this uh, lack of access to technology that's used in the classrooms, as it should be, I mean, technology is our future, but if we can't access it, we being the dis disability community, then it, it, it puts a barrier between us and, you know, occupations and just life in general. So it's not, um, you know, it's, it should not be allowed to exclude us from doing the things we need to do for education. Um, like I said, I was uh, denied the ability to take a specific class because I could not access this. So uh, I strongly encourage you to vote in favor of this bill um, because failing to do so will deny me and other blind people like my sister the access to the technology we need to get an education and then be a successful member of the workforce. Thank you, Mr. Day. And finally, Mr. Uh, Lazar, uh, spe please speak to the amendment more than the bill in general, if possible. Absolutely. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair, distinguished members of the EHE committee. I'm Jonathan Lazar, professor at the University of Maryland, um, incoming director of the Trace Center for Research and Development, uh, the nation's oldest research center on technology and disability. I'm here representing my own opinion, not that of the Trace Center in the University of, or the University of Maryland. Um, I mentioned that I support the bill with amendments. Uh, the specific amendment that I submitted in my written testimony relates to the procurement aspect. Um, and Senator Lamb actually discussed that in his sponsor amendment. Uh, so I fully am on board and agree with uh, what Senator Lamb had suggested as the amendment. Uh, this is a common sense bill. It saves money. It stops barriers from being created against students with disabilities. And the techniques in the bill for procurement are already used by the state of Maryland, 
they're already used uh, by the federal government, they're used by companies, uh, tech companies know how to do this. So the amendment that Senator Lamb mentions um, specific, and uh, that I also suggest um, specifically describes that uh, procurement, that accessibility requirements related to indemnification and indemnification clauses should be included in the uh, call for proposals as well as the actual procurement contract. So you don't wait until you've already procured the technology, right? Determine it's inaccessible and then ask the uh, tech company, the vendor to um, indemnify. So I am fully uh, supportive of Senator Lamb's amendment. Um, it includes my suggestions and I hope you'll support this bill. It helps remove barriers for students with disabilities. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lazar. Question for the proponent or the advocates Behind him, we have one opponent we're going to get to in a moment, Senator Carroza. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I think our Senate sponsor, Senator Lamb, did have to leave. And you, did, did you say we had oral um, testimony after this? Senator There's Lamb's not here to answer a question. Is that correct? Senator Lamb, thank there you. were three advocates supporting uh, Senator Lamb, and okay. there would be one opponent, Mr. Okay. I had a question for the Senate sponsor, but I think he said he had to leave. I'll take yes. it and maybe ask my question for the next witness. Thank you. Thank you. Um, opponent, we're going to go to uh, Mr. Wollums from Abe. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, John Wollums representing the Maryland Association of Boards of Education, um, testifying in opposition to uh, Senate Bill 921. Um, certainly uh, incredibly sympathetic and, and troubled by the uh, uh, lack of access described by uh, some the parents and students uh, before you today uh, and um, agree that accessibility is key uh, to uh, uh, educational materials, uh, website access and the like uh, for uh, students regardless of disability uh, and, and, and their families. That said, um, this is Maryland's first look at applying uh, the federal uh, section 508 procurement requirements uh, to school systems, and we believe it's uh, going to be a, a heavy lift and may not be uh, a perfect fit uh, for application to local school system procurement. Uh, I think some of the uh, penalty provisions in the law, some of the timelines, uh, and uh, the comprehensive nature of all the new definitions and requirements in the legislation speak to our concern uh, that this is um, a pretty substantial change uh, from the way we have uh, procured educational uh, technologies and materials in the past. Uh, certainly support uh, the amendment with regard to uh, indemnification of the vendor, uh, shifting that burden, that makes uh, a lot of sense. And as a prospective, a prospective procurement requirement, of course, as well. But the bill would require us to do a look back uh, as well in 18 months at everything we have. And so this could be a pretty substantial shift. There were some pretty prominent technologies mentioned um, and I am not aware of the extent to which the vast array of tools and, and technologies we're using today have the capacity to be 508 compliant. So in that regard, I think there's um, a little more work to be done and a September, 20, a September 21 timeline to implement this uh, is, is awfully fast uh, to, to shift the way in which we, we purchase educational technologies. Um, and so while that may sound a little bit like support with amendments with regard to timeline and parameters around the bill, uh, we, we are uh, opposed to Senate Bill 921. Thank you. Senator Carosa. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I wanted to follow up with um, uh, Mr. Wollums on his testimony. I, I, I think what I heard you, I think we all have a shared goal um, that COVID-19 and virtual learning has showed our vulnerabilities um, especially, um, you know, with students with disabilities and the need for improvement. So I think there's, you know, there's an, a, you know, a shared goal and understanding. I guess what concerned me is um, when I see that, you know, I don't know how the legislation was developed. It doesn't sound like you were consulted, nor MAKO. And, and when I hear about, you know, for the first time federal, uh, procurement requirements um, being applied, we want to be successful in whatever we do. So, uh, you know, I, I, my, I guess my question is, were, you know, were you consulted or were any, was anybody locally pulled in before um, the legislation was uh, introduced? Um, Senator, uh, not to my knowledge, I, I will say that uh, there are these 
little 508 or many 508 bills out there and, 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 and a couple states do have them. So I, I have not been completely unaware of this initiative, but re relative to this specific bill, no, I'm not, I'm not aware of outreach. Um, uh, there was the letter to all the systems described earlier, but I'm not aware of outreach to, uh, to the boards or superintendents with regard to this legislative initiative. Thank you. Okay, uh, that completes the hearing on uh, Senator Lamb's bill. We're going to the final bill, which is mine. It is fairly short and fairly sweet. It is Senate Bill 927. Uh, a couple of years ago, we passed a bill which I sponsored saying that uh, higher education institutions could not pay people for recruitment. Uh, and that came about because a lot of particularly for-profits were going after poor and working people knowing that they could get federal aid and that there was no uh, skin in the game for the institutions. And some of these institutions have actually gone bankrupt and had to close. The intent was not to have these people uh, get paid per head for scouting and, um, and becoming headhunters to fill the coffers for some of these companies. Well, the fact is that we may have made the bill a little too broad. Uh, there are a number of higher ed institutions that um, recruit from abroad, for example, and those students cannot or do not receive any federal aid. So they're not doing it to fill their coffers with federal money. Um, yes, they are recruiting people who can pay. Um, and in some cases they can't afford to have a recruiter in Indonesia or in India or elsewhere. So all this bill does is, is limit the, the scope of that original bill. And it says that um, it, the uh, original language does not apply uh, in the recruitment of a foreign student who is not eligible to receive federal student assistance and resides in a foreign country. So it allows um, the nonprofit institutions and any institution for that matter to uh, uh, expand their reach uh, outside of the country as long as they're not getting paid per head uh, to recruit people who are going to school on the government's dime. So that's what the bill does. Um, so let me have that we have two witnesses uh, and there's no one signed up in opposition. We have um, Kent Devereaux and David DeMario and either you can go in whichever order you choose. Hi there, Senator Pinsky. Um, I'll go first. Uh, this is, um, I'm Kent Devereaux. I'm uh, the still relatively new president of Goucher College. I arrived in Maryland a year and a half ago, so I haven't had the opportunity to meet many of you in person yet. Um, I think, uh, Senator Pinsky, you've, you've pointed out what I think is uh, the primary thing that we're uh, trying to bring um, to um, everyone's attention is that uh, many small colleges, uh, those who are not uh, brand names like Harvard or Johns Hopkins, actually have to use international agents if they want a diverse uh, global experience on their campus. Um, so um, the purpose of this amendment would to this bill would be to bring Maryland back into uh, alignment with federal law, which uh, prohibits uh, use of commission based agents uh, for those students who receive either federal or state aid, but not uh, international students. Um, so that's uh, the provision that we're really kind of focused on here. Uh, I also want to point out there's there's two other big benefits to this. Uh, first and foremost, there's a financial benefit to Maryland students because for a campus like uh, Goucher, uh, we recruit international students who uh, we don't offer state aid or institutional aid. We offer some merit aid. Those students pay a little bit more, just like the public's recruit out-of-state students that pay an out-of-state tuition that helps subsidize Maryland students. And so there's a financial component that is quite significant um, to many colleges. But the other more important thing for us is that our uh, foundation is about a global education. And so having a diverse campus here with students from many countries around the world come to here uh, is very, very important to us. And without the ability to use um, agencies, uh, certified agencies, that use certified agents around the world, um, it is impossible for us to send uh, admissions counselors around the world to different countries. Uh, and it helps us prevent the situation from us being dependent upon one or two countries like China or Saudi Arabia 
where suddenly a political turmoil could put the college in serious uh, trouble. Uh, so um, that's pretty much what I want to cover. Just those those really two points: the uh, financial benefit to Maryland students, uh, as well as the, the the desire on our part and for an educational objective to create a diverse campus uh, on our campus here with uh, more international students. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Welcome to Maryland, and wish you the best at Galcher. Thank you. Go to uh, David Di Maria from UMBC. Good afternoon, Chair Pinsky, Vice Chair Kagan, and members of the committee. My name is David Di Maria, and I'm Associate Vice Provost for International Education at UMBC. I'm also a former president of the American International Recruitment Council, which is a 501c3 nonprofit membership association recognized by the U.S. Department of Justice and the Federal Trade Commission as a standards development organization for the field of international student recruitment. I appreciate the opportunity to offer testimony today in favor of Senate Bill 927 which would better enable higher education institutions in Maryland to recruit qualified international students. And I've also submitted written testimony as well. As a scholar practitioner who studies global trends in higher education, I'm unaware of any other state that has a legal prohibition on commission-based recruitment of international students. In fact, a study published last month by the National Association for College Admission Counseling showed that approximately half of higher education institutions in the US currently utilize commission-based recruiters as part of the international student recruitment strategy. And as we face global competition for talent, it's important to note that 75% of international students who enroll in Australian institutions do so via commission-based recruiters. And an estimated 69% of Canadian institutions rely on commission-based recruiters. In many countries around the world, these private counselors represent the main source of guidance for students interested in applying to an institution abroad. And there are many safeguards in place to protect both students and enrolling institutions. The American International Recruitment Council has a robust certification process that ensures that the uh, recruiters adhere to high professional standards. The National Association for College Admission Counseling has guidelines for member institutions to use in vetting, contracting, and otherwise engaging these commission-based uh, recruiters. And the US Department of Commerce has a program, a gold key service that uh, allow, helps US institutions be matched with pre-vetted and qualified commission-based recruiters in various parts around the world. So considering the increased competition for global talent and the needs to be in alignment with practices of our competitor institutions, I appreciate your favorable consideration of SB 927. Thank you. And thank you. Uh, questions for the sponsor or the witnesses? Uh, seeing none again, uh, it has uh, support from Morgan State University, MICUA, uh, St. Mary's, and a number of other institutions. Okay, uh, that concludes the hearing on that bill. Thank you for your patience. Sorry it's so late, uh, both to the witnesses and to the committee. Uh, that brings to the end of today's hearings. Uh, as I said, you will receive a voting list and maybe even a second. Um, we don't know if there'll be a second session tomorrow night. So after the hearings, we are planning on having some period of time for um, for voting. With that, uh, get some rest, uh, take a walk outside if you can, and 